your alternative talk radio contact, the planet, KGRARadio.com. With infinite complacency, people went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Welcome to another episode of Into the Fray, hovering over you like a black triangle in a deserted field. Visit the mothership at intothefrayradio.com. There you can find all the episodes, the blog posts, ITF gear, and sign up for the free guest newsletter. The weekly show is, of course, always free and available in all podcatchers, but if you'd like to support the show, and why wouldn't you, go to the website and click Become an Insider, which in turn gets you extra content each and every month. And by the way, if you would be so kind as to leave a rating and review in your listening platform of choice, Cosmic Karma shall be yours. Be part of the discussion by joining the interactive ITF Facebook group, Follow on Twitter at ITF underscore radio and Instagram. If you have an experience that you'd like to share, email Shannon at intothefrayradio.com. Thanks so much for listening. Now, if you would be so kind, buckle up your safety belts. Put that tray table in the upright position. Liftoff is upon us. Well, thank you for joining me on this fine evening. Oh, thanks for uh, inviting me and uh, and having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, I, I got finished with the book uh, earlier today. I did that on purpose so it'd all be fresh in my mind. And holy cow, there's a lot of stuff in there. But you did your due diligence to try to capture as much of it as you could. Yeah, we're talking about four years worth. Yeah, a lot of uh, yeah. due diligence, a lot of cat chasing his tail. I'm pretty sure you're aware of. Yes, <laughs> yes, I am, and we'll get into that. And if if people can't tell already, this is uh, Keith Linder, and of course he uh, was the tenant of the Bothell Hell House, which is the name of his new book. It is the Bothell Hell House Poltergeist of Washington State, and there's also a new documentary out called Demons in Seattle Uncovered. And uh, I wanted to go ahead and. While we're talking here, doing the intro, if people wanted to pop over to your YouTube channel, it is under Keith L., but just to let everybody know, I actually typed in the Bothell Hell House, and that also will pop it up straight away. That way, people can check out all of your evidence, because you, I kept scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. I'm like, wow, he has put a lot of information up uh, on his YouTube, so big high five there. Oh, thank you, thank you. I thought we would start off with for those people that saw you on ghost adventures because you were you and your home and tina were featured on an episode of ghost adventures so i wanted to get that out of the way straight away and how and i of course i've read the book i saw all the details of what was going on and not going on as far as what they were sharing and not sharing so i wanted to get that out of the way for folks that have seen that episode and just to, to hear your side so that everybody can hear your side of what was going on with that episode of that very popular TV show. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's interesting because um, the episode Demons in Seattle, uh, Ghost Adventures, their episode, it aired, I think, over the weekend. And how I know is during the, whenever they re-air that episode, there's a spike in activity mm. Uh, on various websites of mine, um, I get emails, I get uh, trolling, yeah. and um, some of the takeaway. And it's a small percentage. The percentage of trolling is smaller and smaller each year, but there's always a few. And 
one of the things that me and Tina caught early on, this is like three years ago when the episode originally aired, was people incorrectly extrapolated from that episode that just because Ghost and Zack and crew um, didn't get any evidence during their 45-minute episode, um, that must mean that we were hoaxing it all. And three years ago, I mean, we were taken aback because the negative response was tenfold. Mm-hmm. Of Ghost Adventures crew left without getting anything, therefore they're faking it. It's Tina, it's him, they're attention seekers. And um, the episode aired in February of 2015. Ghost Adventures came, I think it was late November, the previous year. And we had no communication up until the episode aired. So when the world saw it air for the first time, that's when we saw it. Uh, that's when the homeowner saw it. And uh, that's when our friends and family saw it. And um, we were really taken aback because, keep in mind, the activity was still happening after they left. And we're sitting in videos and pictures and photos. and um, But we're not getting anything returned back to us. Mm-hmm. So, and there's several parts in the book that I had to reiterate, and I sort of put it in the chronological order of when they came and how things progressed. Um, but yeah, we got we got a lot of uh, I got a I guess a lot of slack for that. Um, them not finding anything. Of course, uh, the house was active, um, just because the team comes in there, and they were there for a relatively short period of time. I'm talking about five hours of actual investigation, and Previous teams have come in before and after them, and they stayed longer. And all the teams will tell me that it's rare do you get um, evidence the first time around, uh, especially specifically if you're going to be there for a short period of time. Uh, they were there for a specifically short period of time, and that's okay. But the episode, you would never know that by watching the episode. Right. And how it was construed afterwards and on social media and blogosphere. And even um, Zach and Crew's reaction once other teams came in and made their claims public. Uh, I'm talking about the, the uh, UK guys and the US teams because they lived in the house. Uh, they lived in the house three weeks, two weeks. And of course, you're going to, your percentage of finding evidence is going to go up tremendously once you live in the house. So, um, yeah, it left, it left a bitter uh, taste in our mouth, the experience with the uh, with that uh, that team, the Ghost Adventures team. Because you, you mentioned in the book that they ignored three pretty significant events, and it was events that you guys were quite used to, including and in, uh, not limited to battery straining and just malfunctions and i i i do i i have that in my dvr i just didn't have time to rewatch it because i was more focused on actually reading your book and your side of things but i i do remember uh zach at one point i think it was just prior to you guys actually leaving the the home and kind of turning it over to them for those few hours but i think zach accidentally almost ran into Tina at one point and it was very dark in there and it kind of spooked him and it kind of seemed like they made kind of a, a bigger deal out of that than maybe was necessary. I don't know what he saw because it was dark anyway, but you could see on the night vision that he kind of, you know, he made this like big jump, like he had yeah. seen something scary in her for some reason. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because keep in mind, um, yeah, the, the room was totally pitch black. And by pitch black, because they, they darken the windows too. When they're filming, they darken all windows in the home for the imagery effect. But the room is pitch black. And uh, and the episode shows that, you know, they ask us to walk around the house, talk to the spirits, and talk to the ceiling and whatnot. And what people don't realize, because the show is edited, but um, that whole circling of Zach and Tina, and Tina caught a lot of hack for that, um, because... Yeah, Zach did jump. Uh, they almost did uh, bump faces, but how the episode unfolded or how they really unfolded is basically um, Tina was telling everybody that she smelled burnt sage. And me and Tina know specifically anytime we smell burnt sage in our house, that's not a good sign. So we're, we're kind of happy that the team is there because now we smell burnt sage. Maybe that's a trigger or indicator that something's about to jump off. Mm-hmm. But it's pitch black. We don't know where the other person is. And her and Zach almost come face to face. Well, in the true manner of things, after they almost headbutt, if you will, 
everybody bust out laughing. It was very levity. It was very like, ha ha, you scared me, ha. And Tina told Zach, you know, stop acting like a wimp. You know, I'm, I'm using it nicely, but yeah. she, said, she said, stop acting like a wimp. And we all bust out laughing. The guys in the garage are laughing, ha ha ha. And then we resume back to what we were doing. But there's a sage stick um, that they used for a reenactment scene earlier that day that's still smoldering on the kitchen table or the kitchen counter. Um, I think the episode even shows it briefly. And that's what she was homing her nose in on. And two and a half months later, and Zach, you know, the, the voiceover, and this is the voiceover, this is Zach in a studio saying, hey, I, I met Tina face-to-face, I got an uneasy feeling, she looked weird or whatever. Yeah. That That's two, almost three months later. Um, Zach never would have said that with Tina. There, and it didn't even happen that way. It was very levity, very laughable moment. So then in that sense, we, we when we saw the episode, we felt like they were not on our team. We kind of we had that vibe when they walked in that everybody's not on the same team here. Um, other teams have come in our home and we could tell almost immediately if they're on our side, if they're not on our side. And it's, I mean, you could tell by the episode that they were, it definitely was not on our side, but, um, yeah, I just want to convey the truth in that episode and, and how that manner, um, went out. Yeah. Because when they're on their way out and you guys are on your way in, I don't know if there was that moment of you literally, they're leaving and you're coming back. Uh, I mean, are, they're probably not divulging anything. You're probably dying to know, and I, I'm assuming yeah. maybe they're just very tight-lipped. And they may do that at every location, but they do. They 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 did it. There's 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 a, there's a sign waiver that they um tell you. I mean, everything is close knit due to okay. that. They they don't want anything going out into the the, the social blogosphere. Right. But um, just another thing to reiterate. Um. I was not familiar with Ghost Adventures prior to this um, experience me and Tina had, but I did go watch a few of their previous episodes after they left our house, especially after the episode ours aired. And you're right, there was a lot of equipment malfunction while they were in our house that they would not call attention to, that I've seen them call attention to on other shows and other episodes. Um, They had a lot of battery drainage, Ghost Adventures did, with their cameras in the office, and we all know about my infamous crazy office. Um, they had a weird equipment failure in the kitchen. Uh, they had a weird equipment failure in the hallway and in the master bedroom. And um, other teams have come in, Steve Merritt, Don Phillips in particular, who suffer the same type of equipment failure, battery drainage, after loading a fully loaded battery pack. will pivot their investigation because they know, okay, that's I mean, we can't say battery drainage by itself is paranormal, but in trends and previous cases, we can say that's what we need to focus on and home in on because there seems to be something going on with the energy level, whether that means bring out the EMF, bring out the gauze readers, stuff like that, and try to pull the, the whatever is here or force them to engage with us. And that's how other teams were able to capture evidence rel- relatively easy is because they paid attention to the subtle surrounding changes like equipment failure, uh, objects disappearing that they place themselves and then going back and looking at objects not there anymore. So uh, when I saw other episodes where they go on other locations and they, they make a big hoorah out of their cell phone dying or something else dying, I'm like, dude, you like, we like had five of those in our house and you guys were not even, that didn't even move you emotionally. So it was just kind of interesting. Yeah, and you mentioned in your book, which until you brought it up, it didn't even cross my mind, but maybe they just never do this because it's kind of like, okay, on to the next thing, on to the next case and more filming. But you kind of said it's odd that they didn't take any samples of, and we'll get into the details. Everyone's going to go, we don't know anything about this, but you will soon. Uh, The black substance that was on, I mean, all over the walls, uh, on the doors, in your office, they didn't take samples of that. And they also didn't take anything from... Uh, the burned Bibles. Uh, I don't know. That seem, just seems like if it, that seem, yeah, yeah that it, weird. if they think this is a true case, if I was someone that was really, really interested in this, I would be all over that. I'd be like, well, I don't know who I have to talk to or if it will cost any money and we'll have to find out, but let's find out. Yeah, because keep in mind, they have three months before the episode or two and a half months before the episode really aired. So right. they could have took, they could have took a Bible, a page or two of the Bible, put it in a Ziploc bag. They could have took samples of the paint 
And they would have got results by the time the episode aired. Right. You know, because I, I remember there was at a roundtable discussion. They were like, well, do you think it's spray paint? Well, they're asking each other these questions. Well, if you think it's spray paint, take some with you. Yeah, they could, and they have the money behind them too. That's what's a little frustrating is they have uh, I, they have Travel Channel's money if they wanted to really, yeah. really find out what that was. I just think that they, they didn't. They had a preconceived thing and they, I don't know though, it's just so odd that a TV show wouldn't glamp onto every single little thing as battery drains. Like you said, they bring that stuff up all the time on other episodes. Yeah, they bring that all the time and one of the reasons I was excited, I think you saw it in the book of how I was like, oh, they're, they're, they're affiliated with the travel channel. They travel the world over. Right. They're going to have resources uh, that they most teams don't have resources to that they can rely on and say, hey, test this page or here, test this door paint. And they may get results and, they like, and the results come back, oh, that's kind of interesting. That's kind of weird. You know, this paint hasn't been sold since 1700 or right. this is – and all that opportunity – would have come back to them before the episode went live. So, um, yeah, that, that was that's what disappointed me. And I even noticed the first time they walked through my door because they gave us the script of how long they were going to actually investigate and what they were going to actually do. I knew then they were not going to get much because living in the house the way I've lived in it, I know what the spirit can buy its time on. The spirit can sit quiet and go docile if all you bring as a as an Xbox connector or whatever. Um, so yeah, I, I was really uh, disappointed, but they were already on on the ground on the premises by then. Well, I appreciate you going through that. I just wanted to get that out there in the beginning, and if people are like, "Oh, that's that's Keith Linder from Ghost Adventures," that way they can hear your side of things before we jump in. So I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Thanks for asking. So, uh, Bothell, Washington. Now, I used to live up in the, that area. I used to live in Kent, and then I drove into downtown Seattle every day for work. And it's funny because if, if you don't <laughs> live up there, you don't know how bad the traffic is. But Kent is only 15 miles from Seattle, and I got out of work right at 5, and I'd head south for 15 miles. And people still don't believe me. that. Of course, this is 10 years ago. I'm sure it's worse now. But it would take oh, yeah. me usually two hours to go 15 miles. Still um, does. Still does. Yeah, I bet. It was <laughs> But it's funny what you get used to. Now when I look back, I'm like, how the hell did I do that? Why did I do that? But you just get used to it, right? Yeah, you just get used it's to it. It's so have pretty up there. Good yeah. music playing. But yeah, 15 minutes is nothing because uh, that could be two hours or it could uh-huh. be 15 minute car ride. All That's depends right. On, yeah, well, closer is. to what it's supposed to be. But uh, okay, so for people that don't know where Bothell, Washington is, let's uh, let's let them know. Yeah, Bothell is about 20 minutes, uh, well, yeah, about, about 25 minutes north of Seattle. Um, like you said, it's a, it's one of the suburbs um, outside of Seattle. There's plenty, there's many suburbs outside of Seattle, and Bothell um, is one of them. Um, it's very woody, very tall trees, very green. Um, I think the population is somewhere around 300,000, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's nice if you if you live and work in the same suburb, that would be amazing. But most people in in uh, the Seattle area, that's not the case, right? They that's have not, to do no. the, the commute. So, Yeah, got to go to the big city. So how long were you and Tina together before you found this house? And let's kind of let people know how you found this property. And it's not an old property. The home was actually no. built in 2005. Yeah, me and Tina were together two years prior to moving into the Bothell house. Uh, we met in 2010, and um, she had her place, I had mine. Um, what made us come up with the idea of moving in together was I um, had obtained a new uh, job position, new job promotion. We were on our second year, and uh, we just say it was time to just take it up to that next level. Um, the house, like you said, is virtually brand new. We moved in May of 2012. And the house was built in 2005. The whole neighborhood, for that matter, was built in 2005. Um, and we searched online, me and Tina, uh, together, and uh, we found it on Craigslist. Um, we talked to the owner maybe two months prior to moving in or three months prior to moving in. It was occupied by a previous family. He had just listed it early because he really wanted to get somebody in there quickly, which was kind of weird looking back on it. But... Um, so, yeah, then we uh, moved in in May and um, tried to make a go of it. 
me and Tina, not knowing that something was already there, obviously. Yeah, and you kept saying this throughout the book, and I totally get it because I would be the same way. Because you said that you just you guys get hounded on with interviews, and they're going, "Well, did you screw with Ouija boards? Are you reading satanic <laughs> Bibles? Like, what did you guys do to to bring this on oh, yourselves, man. right?" And you guys are kind of going, "We didn't. That wasn't our our bag before we moved in. We didn't do any of that." Yeah, every I mean, we we, we filled out a lot of questionnaires me and Tina from local teams and teams abroad and I get you got to ask those questions because you're trying to determine root cause and what could be the real reason why this stuff is happening so yeah I, I must have answered 50 different questionnaires of did you two play with a Ouija board recently right. um, did you have activity in your current location and uh, no we had none of that uh, me and Tina and me especially I'll speak for me primarily of uh, I was never really um I was always 50-50 about the paranormal. Um, I've never dove or dwelled into the paranormal. I would watch a scary movie every so often, Halloween usually. Um, but there was never me like, oh, paranormal or, or my friends. But uh, who doesn't like a good ghost story every now and then? That's about as far as I would go. I grew up in a uh, Southern Baptist Christian home. I'm from the South, from Texas. And um, so, yeah, I was 50-50. Um, our parents, my dad primarily told me ghost stories as a kid growing up, but never, no, nothing, no activity in my previous, uh, uh, dwellings in my apartments and my townhomes and other places that I lived. And the same thing for Tina. Um, we had two different locations when we were, uh, dating and we were together two years. So there was nothing going on, uh, at her house and definitely nothing going on at mine. And, uh, which made this puzzle even bigger because when we moved in together, um, you know, friends, certain family members start asking questions about, hey, how well do you know Keith if, he, if you're having ghost problems? Right. Or, Keith, how well do you know Tina? You know, my brother's like, how well do you know Tina? And so, yeah, we're like, I've known her two years. I mean, there, there's, there's nothing jumping out at me. And no, we, we would never touch. I knew of a Ouija board and I knew enough to stay away from them my whole life. So, yeah. Especially now, huh? You're probably like, I will definitely especially, never touch that. <laughs> especially now. I want to probably burn when I touch it, yeah. Yeah, no kidding. Well, I I mean, I know the timeline uh, quite well. I've got lots of notes written down because there's so much activity. But uh, if you want to just kind of move through the timeline and, and start out with, which, by the way, I think the very first incident would have been high on my list of like top fives of all all the creepy things. Um, was that cough that you heard from possibly oh. the little one? And we can move on from there as far as what kind of activity you guys were having going on. But that was right out of the, the gate. But when, how long after you guys moved in did that happen? Well, the interesting thing about the kid cough, and, and, and that still blows me away today, is me and Tina weren't even moved in yet. This was the day we went to go get the keys to the house and sign the papers. So we went, it was like, it was May 1st and we meet the homeowner and we sign the papers, get the keys. So now we're just sitting, he's left. We're sitting in the living room, empty house, no power, nothing. The house is just empty and you can almost hear a pin drop if you were silent. But so we're talking and we're just getting the lay of the land. Hey, this is where we're going to put the, the love seat, the couch, um, all the bedrooms are upstairs. It's a two story dwelling. And out of our conversation, or out of the blue, comes this kid cough. And if you've ever been inside a house that's totally empty, you know sound would travel and bounce off walls because there's nothing impeding it. So we heard this kid cough, and it was very real, very distinct. And me and Tina heard it at the same time, and we looked at each other, and we said, was that a kid cough? We both said that at the same time. So I knew she was thinking what I was thinking because that's how distinct it was. And it sounded like it came from one of the upstairs bedrooms. Um, but we did not get up and go investigate because we were no word thinking ghost at the time. And we just resumed our conversation five minutes later. But it was very interesting because the only thing we could attribute that to was it had to have come outside. Right. But still, why would we be hearing a kid cough? from outside that sound like it came from right next to us. I mean, it sounded very close. It sort of echoed. And um, that was day one of just signing the paper. So I think I moved in a week, 
10 days later or start moving in. And that's when the, I guess, snowball effect, I call it, of items began disappearing. Um, I lost my second pair of car keys almost immediately upon moving in. Uh, Tina's jewelry, her female jewelry started disappearing. Um, we started noticing a depletion of our silverware. Uh, you know, you reach for a fork or a knife or you find yourself looking for one come supper time. And those were just weird and interesting, but we're still not fully moved in. So we attribute those things to they must have got lost during the moving process. Right. Boxes got switched around. Stuff is still at the old place. Um, so now maybe fast forward six weeks almost. Um, we're pretty much getting settled. And now we're watching TV, me and Tina. And we're watching TV together. And uh, Tina has this four-foot-odd tall plant sitting next to the entertainment center. And as we're watching TV, it just rises up off the ground and does a 360-degree spin, and it just kills over. Um, doesn't lower itself back to the ground. It just kills over. And we both saw that because we're looking dead at it. There's no way you can miss it if it's sitting next to the TV. And once again, we, we, we weren't really screaming ghosts at that point because we got up and we're looking for fishing lines, strings, wire, remote control device, um, we thought we were being pranked or punked either by the neighborhood or by the homeowner or by someone. Maybe this is how they welcome new tenants into the neighborhood. Maybe this is the own homeowner. But it didn't make sense. None of that logic made sense. So because, yeah, I mean, how would somebody get in, number one? And we're not finding any wires. We're not finding an electrical device. So then we reverb We went back to the kid car. We were like, aha. Kid cough, missing stuff, floating plant. And we thought it was a kid ghost. Honestly, we really thought it was a kid ghost. Therefore, no harm is going to come to us because it's a kid ghost. Hey, it's kind of neat, kind of cool in a weird way. Um, so you guys were on. not frightened at the in the least bit, even when the word ghost no. came up? No, we just thought it was a kid ghost. I mean, we heard the cough. Um Trinkets were appearing throughout the house. Jewelry went missing. Um, I don't know. I, I never heard of the word malevolent. I definitely never heard of the word uh, poltergeist per se or the word um, demon infested home. But nothing violent had happened yet. And if it's a kid ghost, the internet was telling us, hey, kid spirits sometime linger around an old dwelling unit that they're familiar with. Um, they refuse to pass on or walk on. Um, be kind to them. Help them out, and by helping them out, I mean talk to them calmly. Try to get them to go into the light. Those were what we printed off the internet, and we did try that. We're like, oh, we got a kid ghost. Who who, who wouldn't want to help a kid ghost that's lost mm. get get to where it needs to go? Um, but the reaction from whatever we were talking to was not the reaction that. The, the printout she was telling us. <laughs> no, it was not, was it? <laughs> not, not at all. <laughs> not at all. We're, we're, we're reading the printout she and the reaction is supposed to be, oh, it'll be quiet. No, thank you. In the mm -hmm. end, the kid goes, might leave you some candy as a, as a parting gift. And we're like, okay, then here comes the flying plants or the loud bangs or um, the door slamming while Tina's taking a shower or watching TV. Um, so then we start scratching our heads like, Okay, this kid, go. maybe it's a teenager. <laughs> okay. You're like this little shit. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's like, he won't maybe let he's not, go. He's, maybe he's like 14. Okay, so then we started like, all right, let's dig deeper um, into the internet. And it says sometimes these kid ghosts are, are, are stubborn. You really got to apply, apply, apply. But they generally will get the message and leave you alone. And, of course, um, things start escalating by more objects being thrown, um, more loud banging, and then the appearance of objects that neither Tina or me own, like kid toys and trinkets were just appearing on kitchen countertops, kitchen table, coffee table, and the staircase. I mean, you would come uh, go up the stairs and come back down the stairs within five minutes, and there's a kid toy dead center of the carpet. Mm. Um, we we don't have kids, so where is that coming from? And um, yeah, that was that was really um, interesting. But we're still not thinking malevolent. Uh, we come home from work 
uh, about 5 or 6 p.m. And as soon as you open your front door, you hear pitter-patter. I mean, ba 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 Something's hurrying or scurrying up the stairs. Mm. And it's only me in the home. Tina has not come home yet or vice versa. And that was nearly every time that when the first person would come home. Now, what if you were already upstairs um, in, in your office or doing whatever in the bedroom, maybe even taking a shower, and she comes in second? It, does she still hear pitter-patter? No, no, there's never uh, just the first person. Just, just the first person, yeah. Mm. And it, I, yeah. I found it interesting that you said in in the book that Sundays always felt a little heavier, a little a little denser yeah. to you guys. Yeah, Sunday, especially after eight p.m. Sunday, um, we could always tell what sort of night we were going to have, how much sleep we were going to get, mm. based on the feeling of uneasiness of being watched. Um, that happened almost every Sunday, but some Sundays are worse than others. Um, yeah, you would feel very heavy, um, like trouble wanted to get started. It was itching to uh, start something. And you would hear a lot of pop, poem and pings from the walls, uh, from the ceiling. If you're downstairs, um, all the up bedrooms are upstairs, but if, so if you're downstairs in the den area, you can literally hear it stomping above your head as you're watching TV or having dinner, and you would swore or swear that there's somebody up there. You were like, it's, it's just that much movement and stomping that you would have to sometimes go investigate. Of course, you find nothing. But Sundays, that happened a lot. And if it happened near bedtime, you were just like, oh, man, it's going to be a long night, dude. Mm. It's really, it's, they're, they're so active. And you land in your bed, and you got to put a pillow between the doorways because they'll slam it. I mean, they'll really slam the door um, just when you're about to doze off. Uh, lights will flicker off and on. Uh, Tina had Tina was one of those people. She, she she only likes living plants, and all of her plants would just be thrown and trashed and. We'd have to repottery them and we'd put dirt back on them and save them. They start turning brown and finally all our plants died because they just kept getting thrown to the wall. And there were more on the wall than they were in their, in their, in their pot. So she lost all her plants. And, um, yeah, it would, always, it would always start at night, usually around the uh, 8 p.m. time, especially on Sunday. And something else that my brain just glamped onto, and I'm not trying to automatically make a connection, but, you know, you do enough reading and uh, talking to folks, and it, so you say that it felt denser on Sunday, and something with the banging that I found interesting was that you said it always came in threes, which, you know, if you do some reading and talking to yeah. folks, then it's like the, all sometimes the scratches. If someone gets a scratch, it'll be in, in you know, mocking the Trinity. There's like three um, nail marks or whatever you want to call it. So I just found that kind of uh, interesting. Well, well I, I believe um, there was something to the threes because you're right. Um, we had three Bibles caught fire. Only three. I've had five. Uh, two Bibles are still missing to this day. Mm. Uh, th only three caught fire. Um, the bangs came in sets of three. Um, Tina got scratched a few times, and there were three lines on her arms and legs. Uh, the holes in the walls by her bedside were uh, three. And um, a lot of the things in my office uh, centered ar around uh, three. And a lot of times when I was woken up at night uh, was around 3 at 3 a.m., especially the poking and the prodding and the, the little creepy things. Um, so, yeah, of course, I, I didn't know most of these puzzles then, but looking right. back, cause I kept meticulous notes. Um, I'm a trend spotter. I'm a business analyst, IT uh, project manager, so I look for trends. And, yeah, there was a lot of things that stuck out later on that I saw that centered around the word three. I don't know if you were got, and I'm just, I'll fast forward real quickly, but one of the things uh, Carissa Fleck asked when well, she was standing on the patio doing an EVP session in the middle of the night was, are there any shadow people out here? And I don't know if, if your listeners should really hear that EVP because it's so crystal clear. A kid's voice comes back with three. I mean, she just point blank asked, how many shadow people are out here with her? 
and a kid whispers three, and it's just eerie. But he says three, and there's no um, ambient or breakup noise or static noise. It's a clear what Steve and others call a Class A EVP. But yeah, it was a, definitely a three. Yeah, I encourage everybody to go to the YouTube channel. Uh, I was only I only had time to to click through a certain number of them, but I, there is a lot of evidence in there. And really good EVPs. You've got um, you've got the burnt Bibles in there, like minutes after you found them you you were doing yeah. some video there's orbs lights turning on and off and you can hear all this you know i watched one video where it's it's you kind of walking up the stairs and wh- as we move forward you guys will learn that the hallway was very active and the office was very active and it's kind of like you filming and you can just hear all this just random banging and tapping and things moving around and stuff being tossed and you're kind of going what the hell is yeah. going on in that place i mean it yeah, uh, yeah. People do themselves credit by listening to the videos because when um, the teams left after Ghost Adventures and they set up a lot of listening devices throughout the house, they caught an enormous amount of voices. It blew Steve Mara, parapsychologist, away. The amount of voices that they caught, and these are voices that they didn't know they had until they got back to home base. But they had left recorders on twenty four seven, and you hear these conversations and. I went back and reviewed my old footage because I had a lot of old video files, stuff I never combed through, and even the ones I posted on YouTube because I didn't know what an EVP was. I was just looking for a physical phenomenon, not the right. uh, voices. And other people who've gone to my channel and even my, me myself, you hear all these conversations. The spirits are literally talking underneath me as I walk past the Bible, walk into my office. It's two or three having conversations. Some of you are uttering my name, Keith. And they're talking just full blown. Um, I did like, hear that EVP. That was one of the video videos I watched, and it was really pretty creepy because it's almost like they were. Because you can hear you guys kind of talking, uh, yeah. And then it's almost like this entity was right up against the actual recorder, much as yeah. I can do to my Yeti right now with my microphone. It's like Keith. It, it's yeah. very clear. It's clear it's as day. Clear. I, I, yeah. I mean, sitting here now. And having gone through all of this evidence, how many different entities do you think that you've caught on on EVP? Uh, if we had to go by the evidence alone, about eleven. Wow. Uh, we we peg it. We we think no less than eleven spirits are were in that home all the time. Wow. Uh, we got kid voices, male voice, uh, female voice. Uh, child, adolescent, older male, older female, um, older, older male. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of those, some with accent, some with no accent, um, a lot of uttering and whispering. I mean, we're talking about intelligent, I mean, not just uttering grunts and sounds and words. These are, I mean, they're having conversations. One is an EVP where one spirit tells the other one to steal a camera. Uh, another one is looking at Steve and Don set up equipment. They're trying to guess what kind of equipment it is. Uh, another one is telling him to go um, go into that room and, and take a camera or take a, a cord. Um, they're they're very they're watching me set up equipment and cameras. And I always it always irked me in my book, and I, I sort of say it throughout the book of why my cameras are always missing or turned upside down. And I kind of know why now because the spirits were always there. Uh, one of the things that made me frustrating in my book and I was when teams would tell me, well, you got to put a camera in the flower pot. You got to put a camera in a ventilation system or somewhere where the ghost can't see it. Um, just to be clear, ghosts see everything. I mean, I'm just using the word ghost loosely, but right. these, these spirits see everything. Um, and the, vo- the voices we caught on audio proved that because they were talking while me and others are setting up equipment. And they're very curious, they're very conniving, their intellect and things that they don't understand, they just take. They even said, we don't understand it, we, we, we just take it. Yeah, and you guys, at this point, you've got the, and let's be clear, you had tapping from behind the walls. That's super creepy, by the way. There was the footsteps, yeah. of course, when you come in the room, and then there was banging. Like you said, it was like a sledgehammer uh, hitting yeah. like major support beams in the house, and and at this point, you guys are starting to go, okay, 
let's look online for what what else we can do here or who can come yeah. into the home. And you guys were actually hitting walls because people are going, well, this is a newer house built in 05. Like, you, what are yeah. you saying? You don't, it's not haunted. There's there's nothing going on there. We're not coming over. Yeah, the, the, the thing, the roadblock we kept running with into was no house that new could be either that active or be haunted because it's a new house. And um, it was frustrating because, I mean, we don't know the paranormal. We don't know what, what classifies as a haunted house or not. We're just telling you what happens. Uh, I'm a firm believer it's the first time for everything. But that was the reaction of, no, your house is too new. It's house noise. It's, your house hasn't settled yet. It's still settling. And objects being thrown is not a house settling. Okay. Uh, I've lived in houses all my life. I know what a house settles and what that means. I know this atmospheric changes as the day gets older and younger. The house contrasts and expands in the wood. I get all that. This is not what I'm telling you over the phone, <laughs> okay? Um, if I get up in the morning and go to my closet and grab my shoes and put my shoes on and get dressed to go to work, and from my closet all the way to the front door is tapping on the wall to the left or to the right of me, whatever wall is closest to me. It's tapping, 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 tapping. The sound of something behind the wall following me or trailing me, they're just behind the wall. That's what I was trying to convey in the book of this this tapping noise and this sound. Or you're in your office and the wall behind your computer monitor, there's just tapping. I mean, it's, it's not. sometimes it's almost like Morse code. Sometimes it's just thumps and thuds. And sometimes it's just like something is shifting or moving. It's like trying to, something is shifting its position or body weight to get a closer or better angle uh, near you. And you don't feel like, you, you know you're not in a room alone by the level of noise that you hear coming from um, the wall next to you. And you already touched on this a little bit as far as finding the random toys that, of course, you don't have kids, so it's not you guys' toys for any reason. Uh, something that I just found so interesting, and it makes me wonder about things like your your still missing Bibles to this day and other things that have mm -hmm. gone missing that you've never seen again, is the fact that you guys would find, and I'm not talking about in the mailbox, guys. I'm talking about in his home, he would find, uh, like, letters and bill statements, even from the IRS, from previous tenants. And you guys just moved in. The house was completely empty. You guys moved all your stuff in. We're not talking about from the mailbox. We're talking about it just apported from somewhere, these uh, letters and bill statements from previous tenants. Yeah. So that makes you wonder, like, well, they obviously never saw it because it just appeared here with us. Yeah, and these, these letters are now uh, reappearing in a kitchen drawer that's now full with our stuff. So space is condensed because when you open up the drawer, they come piling out, these letters do. I may be reaching for a pen or a ruler or a fork or knife. And I'm, I mean, we're not talking about one letter. We're talking about 20. And they just pillar out. And you, you look at them, and they've never been opened. They got the time stamp on them. They got 2008, 2009, mm, 2011, 2000, you know, all these dates on there. And you're right. The names on the letters or all pre people who lived in the home, obviously, because they got our address on it. And they just, they were not there previously. Um, I, I feel safe in saying that we probably got letters missing too. I know we got tons of other stuff missing uh, besides Bob. I mean, we have, me and Tina have loads of stuff missing. And they could be popping up in other homes throughout Bothell, throughout throughout wherever, and eventually pop up when the, when the, I guess the season is right back in that home because it was the letters that made me allow me to contact the previous tenant. That's how I was able to um, locate a previous tenant, luckily, because her letter or came to my mailbox and an idea hit me. Let me just start finding these people online who lived here to see if they had previous experience. Yeah, and... Um when you touched on that near the end of the book, the tie-in with the previous tenant, who you call Jane Doe, which I totally understand why, and the gray lady and the white lady, I was blown away, um, especially with what she went through uh, 
personally yeah. and with her husband. And I don't know if, let me see where we're going here next. Maybe, maybe we will go ahead and touch on that now. Um, since you brought it up. So let's go ahead and, and, and this does happen quite a bit later that she actually, it took her a while to, uh, once you initially got in touch with her for her actually get back with you because she says, oh, well, I have to check with my husband to make sure it's okay that I even begin to talk to you because they had such troubles in yeah. that home. Uh, tell everybody what she was going through and what what she actually attempted a few times while living in the same home that, that you were staying in. I, that couldn't have been easy to, to hear. Yeah, that, 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 um, that was one of the things that really put the darkness of that home in perspective for me because it was a sort of a gift that her letter came, arrived to her mailbox. It was a Hail Mary that I went online to look for her. It was a Hail Mary and a blessing that I found her and even more that she responded when I found it. Because who wants to get a weird email from a stranger about ghosts? Right. I mean, I emailed her on on Facebook. That's how I found her. And I just asked her, hey, my name is Keith Linder. I'm living in a home that you used to live in. We're having weird things happen. Did you guys have anything weird? I didn't tell her what the weird things were. Her reply was very cryptic. And she was very um, quick to respond the first time of she gave me three eye winks back in our in our Facebook chat, I drilled her for some more info and she paused and she said the house for them was a living hell. She said she's not ready to talk about it though because her and her husband have just got back together. This is 2014. They lived in the house 2008, 2009. And she said, but let, let me clear it with my husband and I'll get back in touch with you. And I didn't want to press her. I didn't want her to disappear off the internet from me. The fact that she gave me that response was enough for me. Right. But when she came back two months later, and it's important that people understand, she replied to me two months later. That's how long it took for her to get her thoughts together. She said, hey, sorry it took so long for me to get back in contact with you. Me and my husband talked about it. He didn't want me to do it. I mean, it talked to me or resurface uh, that stuff. So I'm just doing it out of a Christian obligation to you. But let me just be blunt. The house was a living hell for us. She said uh, she tried to commit suicide uh, three times in the home. Um, her son, who was a young toddler, was very sick, almost died, developed one of the most rarest forms of meningitis. She said her son saw shadow figures in the home she said he still sees them to this day, and they now moved to Yakima, Washington. Mm. And she said there was kitchen cabinet doors opening and slamming. They had a nanny who at times would hear phantom footsteps. When they were gone, the nanny would watch the kids. And one night they heard a lot of banging. The nanny came downstairs and saw all the kitchen cabinet doors open. And then Rhonda said something very interesting when she said that she was outside on the patio having a cigarette and the sliding door slammed on her her infant baby was probably sitting in a chair at the time she had formula or food on the stove and the sliding door slammed shut and locked her out the house she had to throw a rock uh to get back into the house um i explained in the book and this is a year year and a half two years before i'm having the conversation with the previous tenant of I'm seeing apparitions, what I call ghosts, I learned learn later apparition, of a female figure roaming throughout the house, mainly the office. She likes to turn off lights and take off running. Um, this female figure was very familiar to me once I started talking to the previous tenant. And this apparition looked just like the previous tenant. Uh, in the home. And we became good friends, me and the previous tenant, uh, during a, the ordeal me and Tina went through in the home because she was a person I can go back to for more information, for more intel. And the shadowy figures I already knew about because I had started seeing them myself. Uh, of course, I talk about being locked out of the house numerous times mm -hmm. through the sliding door and the front door, so I understood that. And of course, anybody who's familiar with this case know about the kitchen cabinet doors because we came home a lot and saw our house upside down. 
in every kitchen cabinet door open and closed. But um, no, she was almost even Steven with a lot of the activity, except for the, the fires and the wall writings. I would say a lot of what she were reporting, we were going through. I mean, kitchen cabinet doors, phantom footsteps, uh, shadowy figures. And all of that, and um, just to bring the point home once more, I gave all that information to Ghost Adventures. I gave them her contact info. I gave them her emails and letters, and none of that made it into the episode. Did they try to contact her, and would she have actually uh, participated in anything, even just an interview? Uh, they never tried. They never contacted. I told her that they would because they asked for her info. But they never contacted mm. her. Also kind of strange, huh? Yeah. Um, so you guys moved in in 2012. And you say that she moved out in either 2009, 2010, possibly. So was the house empty in between that time? Uh, no, another family moved in. Um, there's been two families between her and, and me and Tina. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, they moved out in 2009. Um, the only reason why I know about the other families in between is because uh, another neighbor named Rich, he's in the book, was able to confirm how many families lived in the house after she left. I've not been able to find or locate those families. Um, mm. We tried. We, we tried to contact everybody whose letter we got either in the mail by U.S. Postal or by sudden appearance in a right. kitchen. In a kitchen <laughs> right, the apporting, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we tried. <laughs> But yeah, it ran into a dead end with those people. Did Rich say anything like, "Oh, they, it's kind of weird. They left in a hurry," or "Oh, you know"? Did he ever kind of intimate that the other two families there was anything no. odd there? No, but other neighbors did. You know, you always have one individual when you move in, come across the street, and introduces himself to you. Right. And this person did, and he knows everybody in the neighborhood because he he's retired. He watches everybody's house, and he, and he even said when we were moving in, um, he said, "Wow, somebody's always moving into this house." He said. This house has never stayed occupied very long. Uh, welcome to the neighborhood. And even when Tina called the power company and the phone company and started getting things switched over into our name, um, you know, the, the customer service agent on the other end of the phone, when, especially with the power company, was like, wow, this house is always having a new account set up. It's always, you know, we can pull up an address and see the history of who's lived there and, Wow. So, and, and we heard this early on. We heard this like a week or two upon moving in, me and Tina, because we had, I remember she made a conversation about it one day. We were lying in bed. Like, yeah, I called the utility company today, and later on, so I said, wow, this house is always having new tenants. But we were, at that time, we, we just had the kid call. Um, so, even the power company on the phone is saying, oh, geez, another one. Yeah. Yeah. They, <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, you know, I mean, Bothell, Snohomish County, these are relatively small, and it's a house. It's not like it's a right. apartment or something. It's a house, so you think people are going to be there a while. But, yeah, they, they, they make mention of it to her, and it, and it even caught, raised Tina's eyebrow, and it raised my eyebrow. And it really was connecting the dots once we start having activity because we realized, oh, well, that's why. I mean, that I can't tell you how many people have told me in their homes – Something slides a good throne, they just move out. Most people typically uh, just move out without telling anybody uh, for fear of being ridiculed or, or called a hoaxer. They just leave and p try to put that bad part behind them. So that's right. understandable. Right. So. Uh, would you mind covering the coffee cup uh, from your mother? Ah, one of the first, I guess known objects to go missing because I had a conversation um, the night before. This is probably um, the housewarming party uh, early in the book where, you know, I'm from Texas. I moved here in um, 2005. And of course my mom gave me a, as a party gift, a ceramic coffee cup and fast forward to 2012. Um, it's toward the end of the housewarming party. One of my friends is asking me, hey, you got some coffee, Keith? And I'm like, sure, I'll make some coffee. And she's one of my best friends. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm going to make a coffee. I'm, you're going to drink from my mom's cup. I never drink out of it, but I want you to drink out of it. So we have a conversation by the kitchen sink, me and her. And um, the next morning I get up. You know, we had, had weird stuff happen that night. But um, I got up and went to the kitchen and get some coffee brewing. And 
I know when I went to bed, I put that coffee cup that my friend drank from in the kitchen sink. And it's gone. It was gone. And it's never resurfaced. And Tina doesn't drink coffee. Tina's not a... The benefit of living in a house with one person, especially your partner or your mate, is when they don't ever do something, you can just automatically rule them out. Right. Tina doesn't drink coffee. She hates coffee. So I went down there to uh, make coffee... And I see my cup is gone, and it's never resurfaced. And then at that time, other objects started disappearing and reappearing. Um, and then fast forward two years later, after catching all these voices on audio of the spirits talking and murmuring as we're doing stuff throughout the house, yeah, the spirits were right there. They heard me tell my friend the story of how the, the cup came into my possession. They heard me tell my friend that my mom who was almost 3,000 miles away, gave it to me as a parting gift because I moved to the Seattle Northwest totally by myself. And, yeah, and the, and the spirits just take that. And they take a lot of things. And a, Some of the reasons why I think they take things um, is to create or generate energy and to generate angst and to create finger-pointing. Because if you read my book, you're going to see – a lot of the disappearing objects or the appearing of objects, the spirits did that as a means of getting me and Tina at each other's throats. Because if it's just two people living somewhere and something goes missing, mentally the obvious suspect is the next person, right? And um, so that was very interesting why they why they took that cup. The cup is just innocent. It's a coffee cup. It's innocent as innocent can be, but it had value and sentimental value to me. And, you know, it probably was a risk to them of, well, maybe he'll go accuse um, his girlfriend of doing something with the cup. Because they did other things with the cross uh, from Spokane and, and, yeah. uh, and, uh, and other objects. Yeah, and Spokane was always an area of contention with Tina and something else, and we'll get into this a little bit more later, but things that appear, they made something very specific seem to appear uh, to make yeah. it appear that you were doing something with someone else. So they, it, it definitely yeah. seems like they had an agenda out for you guys from the moment that you walked in the house. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was game on. We didn't know it, but it was game on. From the day we walked in, uh, I mean, it's the sign the papers, it was game on. Yeah, for them. So in, in 2013, uh, you touch on the fact that in 2012, let's zip back here real quick, that the first Bible does get taken. But I wanted to uh, kind of touch on the Bibles all at one point. So uh, just to touch on that, uh, that is when that first started to happen. Um, in 2013, though, there was a slight dip in the activity it kind of calmed down a little bit for you guys um but you actually are starting to go okay i want to get this on you know some kind of film or or prove what's going on here because it was a daily and nightly kind of thing and you hooked up your xbox connect and if people don't know what that is it, it sends out uh, little laser beams and it's all the dots right all over the walls guys and it can actually yeah. pick up movement and um is that something to where you can record that solely on the Xbox or you had to hook up something else to record that separately? Well, the interesting thing about the Xbox was um, I was a beta tester for the Xbox One. So for 2013, the activity did die down significantly. We thought we dodged a bullet. The house seemed livable again. We thought we, we never could say what made the activity die down. But we're not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. We're just going to go on with our <laughs> lives. And then late summer, Microsoft, or late spring, Microsoft called me to say, hey, you signed up to be a beta tester for our new Xbox. And what that entails is they come in and drop an Xbox and a new Kinect is not yet released into the market as a prototype. And they monitor you physically, meaning it's Several times out the week, they will come to your house and watch you play games. I'm a computer geek. I play games. I love that. And they're going to watch me play, and they're just there to record your gameplay. They're just really trying to see the system. They can care less about you. They just want to see how the system responds and acts. Are there any bugs? Also, they have a remote team that's watching remotely. And so they come in, and they got all this expensive camera gear, and they got me hooked up and wired up. 
I'm playing whatever game they give me, and they're just watching. Well, one night while they're watching, in the middle of me playing, it's about eight people in a room, including the, the, the program manager, and the program manager is like, stop. Because she's got a little microphone or whatever in her ear. She says, headquarters is telling me something. And she says, headquarters is picking up weird anomalies on the connect that they can account for. And we all look at the screen and you see these black masses, um, maybe, I don't know, golf ball size, a little bit bigger, um, moving throughout in and around me and throughout the kitchen in midair. Mm. They're, they're hovering in midair. Headquarters can't ascertain where that is coming from because if it's a glitch or something, it's going to be something the customer might experience once they get their, their own Xbox. So they made me stop, and they had to observe. And everybody's comparing notes, meaning the engineers in my house and the people back at headquarters. They got their tablets and everybody. And they're looking, and... When I saw them on my, because I'm, I could see them too once they called it to my attention. Of course, I didn't tell them what they were seeing. Right. Um, I knew what I was seeing. I'm like, they're still here, and you, and you know, in my book, I, me and Tina had a, a, a sort of a, a disagreement because Tina thought they were gone, yeah. and I thought they were still here, even though there was no activity. I just felt in my gut that they were still here, and they were all over the place. These, these, they were like floating lava orbs or whatever. That's how they looked. And it blew Microsoft away. I mean, they really thought they had trouble on their hands. And they just wrote a lot of notes and said, we'll deal with this at home base. And, uh, yeah, that was the summer, early fall of 2013. So besides that, at this point, Keith, how much, and I mentioned this at the beginning, how a kind of uh, – well, actually completely involved in this you were and in trying to be proactive and capture this on camera. So at this point that this thing is going on with the beta testing in the Xbox, how many cameras did you have up and how much were you doing just a separate recording for your own purposes? Uh, 2013, zero. I had put the cameras away late 2012. I only had one handy cam uh, JVC camera that I had in the hallway that did capture the ironing board and iron being tossed from one side of the room to the other. That's on my YouTube video. Because my brother and others had talked me into trying to catch some of the violent phenomena. So I would just leave a, a, a video cam going with maybe four or six hours of battery life. And I did catch a few things being thrown. But once the activity subsided, uh, I put that away. Um, I didn't really go camera blown until 2014 when the activity came back in a major way because at that time it's almost daily. I mean, when it came back March of April of 2014, um, we're talking about eight or nine months of daily activity. And that's when I brought out more cameras and buying motion detect, infrared, more video cameras, more tripods, and really erecting the house with cameras everywhere. Uh, 2014 when the activity starts spiking. Yeah, because here's some of the the things that were going on for you guys. You had uh, electrical problems everywhere, cable, power, communications, even your ADT system, which I have myself here, and yeah. very rarely do you have any problems with ADT, and you can call them straight away, and they, they get it fixed. Uh, and the appliances. Yeah. Can you expand a little bit on what was going on with some of your appliances in the home? Yeah, one in particular is the uh, microwave. Um, we had a lot of electrical um, things happening, but the, probably the thing that irked me the most was the microwave game is what I call it. If you put an item in the microwave to defrost it or cook it, you press start and nothing happens. Um, you take the item out because you think you get your microwave is defective or it's about to go out. You put the item back in the refrigerator and walk away. The microwave comes on and starts doing that little whatever you programmed it to. It starts doing that, but that's, there's nothing in it. Mm. And then you're like, "Oh, the microwave working again!" So you go back into your fridge, take whatever you just put out, <laughs> put it back in the microwave, and hit start. Nothing. Nothing. Happens. Oh my god! Yeah. You do this several times, or you walk away, and it does that. Um, dishwasher coming off and on by itself. Uh, Kitchen lights coming off and on by itself. Um, let's hide the uh, frozen chicken or frozen turkey 
uh, Tina would take a frozen item out of the refrigerator, and that item would disappear oh. or be somewhere else in the house. Um, a lot of electrical, I, I would call it uh, whack-a-mole of trying to guess which power outlet is working that day. So you, you're trying to iron your clothes and you're trying to get out the door and beat the traffic and the power outlet is not working. Um, but it was working yesterday. It was working 10 minutes ago. Uh, or it's working for Tina, not me. Or it's working for me and not Tina. And keep in mind, we're bringing electricians in, cable guys in, Comcast in, at and in. And they're finding nothing wrong. I mean, I want people to understand, it's just not us always guessing everything's paranormal related. We're bringing in teams, we're paying money to have them troubleshoot the wiring in the house, and they can't find nothing. TVs uh, change by itself, TVs come on by themselves, TVs turn off by themselves, you're sleeping and the light comes on at night in the middle of the night on by itself, TVs cut off in the middle of you watching it. Um, yes, yeah, so a lot of fire alarms going off uh, by themselves. Um, imagine it's 4 a.m. and you know how ADT is. You can program it to where it says front door open or yeah. back. You hear that in the middle of the night. Front door open. Tina's lying next to me. That that has to put a chill down your spine because you're thinking, oh, my God, somebody's intruding in my house. Yeah. Let me rush up before they invade and get too far in. You go out. Your door is closed. There's nobody in the house. Garage door open. Back door open. That would be horrible in the middle of the night. I mean, absolutely in night, horrifying. In the middle of the night. And sometimes you're watching TV and front door open. You can see the front door from where you're sitting on the couch. <laughs> oh, my that God. Is, that is not open. Yeah, you see all of that. That's why we had to get the ADT security system in the first place because we were waking up with front doors open and... That was a little, at least a little precursor or a little leeway into, okay, they're going to be messing with the doors. We need to have something tell us verbally uh, that the door is open because we're exposed. And yeah, my guess is that was them trying to figure and manipulate uh, the security system. Yeah. So let's go to March and April 2014. And that's when you pretty much say, you guys, it really amped up. You felt like you were completely under attack at this point. Yeah. And just for people to understand, when March and April of 2014 came in, there's something said that when the activity leaves, it generally comes back worse than before. Well, it is worse before because it's worse than before for us because the first major activity after about a year or two months of nothing was a 300-pound armoire getting tossed across the room. And that woke us up in the middle of the night, this armoire. Um, there had been subtle phantom footsteps here and there, uh, a saucer getting thrown like a frisbee here and there, but we were asleep when the armor got thrown because it, it was on, it was resting on one side of the hallway wall and you hear this thunderous crash and, oh my God, you think the car is just plows into your house, something's coming through the ceiling and you look and there the armor is on another side of the hallway leaning like the, uh, Eiffel Tower and there's several holes in the wall. And after that day, after that morning, it was game on. It was constant. Larger objects are not being thrown. They're, not, they're, they're done playing with the pottery. They're done with the little kit toys and all that. They're, they're, they've moved on to bigger objects. It's time to toss some bar stools around. It's time to toss some coffee tables around. It's time to just wreak havoc in your kitchen, your living room, your den, when you guys go to work and come back home, everything is going to be upside down. All your closet contents are going to be out, spread out. And, yeah, there was no building. It was just, no, we, we resumed where we left off, even though that was a year ago. We were back now, and, let, and let's go. And I want to let everybody know that, and I know this from reading the book, but you may not realize this from just watching a few of the YouTube videos, is that you were so wired into your own home because of what's going on that you had you had apps and emails coming to you at work yeah. saying there's motion sensors going off and you could actually almost damn near watch in real time as you yeah. can actually see uh, your your coffee table flipped over your couch and the love seat is like in disarray and it's on its on its uh, face if you will completely turned over and there's nobody there you guys are at work you're gone yeah you're at work and the AD, ADT security is armed and 
modern technology is wonderful. It may not be able to catch the phenomena uh, itself, but it does well in triggering email alerts because I'm at work and all of a sudden, in a split second, my inboxes are filling up with email and it's saying motion detected at home, motion detected at home, sound detected at home. At first, it was false positive. You get one, hey, the, oh, the tr- it's trash day. The guy's up in the trash. And, okay, 11.30, that's the trash guy outside. When you get 50 to 80 emails in several seconds of motion detect, motion detect, and you log in, because keep in mind, every email comes with five photographs because the camera takes a snapshot. And these five attachments show your house normal, because you see your house normal, right? By the time you get down to the 10th email, your house is in, in disarray. It's love seat was once sitting upright. Love seat is now upside down. Love seat is upside down and kitchen cabinet doors are open. Kitchen cabinet doors are open. All the kitchen tables, chairs are poured out. Bar stools are poured out. One bar stool is missing. Ah, a vase has been thrown. Vase is now splattered all over the floor. Oh, all the wines in your wine rack have now are now weirdly aligned on your kitchen floor and the wine rack uh, is open. So all these are photos you see in your in your email filling up your inbox. You also have the ability to log in in real time and view it, and that's what I did. I would log in and see my house um, in disarray, and it just blows your mind. I mean, the ADT security has not tripped off one bit. Mm. It's, it's, it's still on. I can log into it and see that the last person who left the house was me that day or right. Tina that day, and it's still on. It's still green. Yeah, and, and having ADT and the app, it'll show you, okay, garage door open at 1027 a.m., yeah. and it doesn't open again until 5 o'clock when you get home. It'll have actual, like, to-the-minute timestamps. And what I found so fascinating about you getting all of this notification to your inbox is it's literally every single thing that could be tripped was tripped, at that time, and that's why your email inbox is getting flooded. So it's like the house just completely imploded with activity all at once. All at once, like mass chaos, and it's like, yeah, because you like you get all these emails, sound and motion. Sometimes all motion, sometimes all sound, sometimes motion and sound. And what's really, I guess, weird is one time I just said, you know what? I'm at work. I'm going to be at my computer desk. I don't have meetings today. I can sit on with my headsets on and people think I'm listening to music. I'm just going to listen, log into my house and just listen. Let's see what noises my house makes in real time with me just listening. And I'm listening and it's all quiet for two or three hours. And all of a sudden, you just hear a boom, boom. And Motion detect and email pops into your inbox. So the the, the, the equipment is doing what is it's it's, yeah. it's it's meant to do. But then one day I hear I'm, I'm I'm monitoring the hallway, and you hear the sound of furniture being dragged. I mean, you hear it like it's right next to the camera, and it's like big furniture chest of drawer, and you hear that, and you log into the hallway camera, and you hear all these noises. Then you log into the master bedroom, which is only a few feet away, and hear nothing. Or the office. These cameras are within few feet of each other, but the sound or the phenomena is only coming through one. And only that camera is saying motion or sound detected. And you're hearing all these furniture drag sounds on wood, on a wood floor, mind you. And our carpet is 90% carpet. And we don't have furniture that you could drag around that make that noise. And you, I mean, we heard that constantly, either through the cameras or while we were at home, or you hear a loud piano crash. We don't have a piano. So, therefore, why are we hearing <laughs> a loud crash like somebody dropped a piano off the Empire State Building onto our kitchen floor? Because that's what it sounds like. And it just, I don't, I, I can't put a name to that. I, I, I try to tell people that, to understand, just imagine that for a second. You're in your house and you hear a piano drop and it's loud, it's thunderous. So, yeah, where does that noise come from? Let's jump to March 31st of 2014. 
And I believe this is when you're, I mean, it's always in such inopportune times and very exposed moments, you know, when you can't defend yourself or really just hop out and go look at what the hell's going on. I think you were in the shower and the fire alarm goes off and let everybody Uh, know what decided to show up and what was in there. Yeah, that was the first uh, fire in the house that came from my office. Tina had just left for work. Um, typical work day and um, we had saged the house pretty heavily the night before due to activity and um, as I'm getting out to shower the fire alarms go off and I knew something bad was going on I just didn't know to what extent so I rush out bathroom rush out of my bedroom and once you rush out of our bedroom you're immediately on the hallway landing and I could tell you as soon as I get to the doorway of my bedroom, something invisible, of course, runs past me. I know because of two things, the thunderous footsteps and the whoosh of the force of power running past me. I always compare it to if you ever are so unfortunate to change a flat tire on a highway during moving traffic Mm -hmm. and those cars zoom by you. That's what this felt like. And it, it, it runs past me, and it, it's coming from the direction of my office, mind you, and it runs past me, and it pitter-patters down the stairs. The front door opens wide and slams shut. I saw that. It, not, nobody's there. Nobody walked in. Nobody walked out. It's only done that twice. And my brain thinks intruder in the house, even though there's really nothing to give me the idea that why it would be an intruder, but I respond because I don't run first to the direction of the fire. I run to the direction of the front door because I want to see the intruder as he's leaving my house. And I get to the front door and Ghost Adventures did do a a sort of reenactment of this, of me trying to open up that front door and the door was sealed shut. I couldn't, the door not wouldn't budge. It was unlocked, but it would not give an, I couldn't open the door. It was like a force was behind me above me holding that door shut so then i run upstairs and i I I realize that my poster is on fire and smoke is billowing out of my office and into the house so i douse that i put that out and i resume back to the front door because now i gotta get smoke out of this house um and the front door still doesn't open and the fire alarms are still wailing and that's when i dial 911 um and reported to the fire department and the lady on the other end could every time i would give her my address um she it would break up static would break up only the part when i gave my address Mm. it would uh be a huge amount of static i think i took three or four tries for that um then i called tina tina this is all within three or four minutes tina hasn't even made it to the highway yet i told tina after i called the fire department to turn around the house is under attack. Um, the fire department came, of course, a few minutes later. Equally dumbfounded. Posters don't catch fire. There's no accelerant. There's nothing as to why this poster caught fire. Um, they made two trips that day and a, a few days later, them and the captain, and they could not determine the root cause of the fire. Of course, I knew. Once again, I'm not going to tell them. But, um, yeah, that that's what led us to sit in the, the priest's office for about five or six or eight hours that day yeah because you guys were pretty fed up at this point right we were fed up we were exhausted we had been given a run around uh, by a lot of teams especially the local parish and we were fed up we were say people were telling us no via email or not returning our phone calls so we were like if they're going to tell us no today after this fire they're going to tell us to our face right and, yeah, we went down there, and we didn't have an appointment, and we said to the lady, we were nice and cordial, respectful, but we said, um, we'll wait in between his appointments, but we're not leaving until he sees us. And if he told us no, then, okay, that's on him, but at least we came. He, he had a document of us coming here, and, um, yeah, he saw us uh, about five or six hours after that. Yeah, and what did, what did he tell you guys? Oh, he was, <laughs> well, um, he was very apologetic. Mm-hmm. Um it was almost comical, frustrating combined because on his notepad were all Tina's messages of call us, call us, call us, 
keep in mind, his secretary had been telling him, he's going to call you, he's going to call you. Right. And uh, he had a pile, I mean, it was a sizable pile <laughs> of Tina's messages. And right. he was either cheesy and like, hey, I'm bad, I'm sorry for not calling you guys soon. And keep in mind, we had been trying to get him for three months, I mean, yeah. for three weeks already. This is about three or four weeks into the activity. And um, so, yeah, he, he was very remorseful um, and embarrassed by the fact that here's all these uh, notepads of Tina and me's phone number. He hasn't even called us one time, but yeah, that's in the book. Yeah. That's gotta be pretty frustrating. I'm sure you guys are like, oh, we just wanted you to come over and just give us 20 minutes, man. Just something. Give us, give us, it's, it's very disheartening to go through something like this. If you're going to s- tell us, no, we'll move on to other people and other things. Right. But if you tell us, we're going to call you back. We think you at least have some sort of buy-in because, okay, he's going to call us back. Why wouldn't we believe you? You're a priest. You're, you're a person who said numerous times before that this is what you do. Your other parents referred us to you. Um, we're just telling you what we see and saw. You can come in and make up in your own mind what it is and deal with it. But if you don't want to help us, then tell us. and We, 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 we move on to other things. And a lot of paranormal teams and a lot of uh, religious houses um, led us on just thinking – and we sort of got the idea halfway into it. Why don't they just go on and leave us alone already? Why don't they just and uh, just tell us no? Just tell us, hey, our, our cup runneth over. We're full right now. Or right, something. Just tell us something. You got the house from hell. Get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> Give up now. <laughs> Give up now. You know, we asked. We asked. We had came to our house. Like, is this something that we need to run from or leave and cut our losses? And we even asked him that over dinner several times, the priest. Yeah. And he told us, no, no, you guys are doing the right thing by standing your ground. Right. We're here to back you up. Yeah. I mean, you guys hit so many roadblocks. It's astonishing when you read through the books um, I, with every aspect that you guys tried to do. Okay, so this next part really also was like kind of in the top five of like creepy things that I read in the book. Uh, let's talk about the, the good old Katy Perry uh weekend and the whole unplugged tv thing really got me keith it really really did i'm going oh boy Uh, that i mean that's just that's just unreal that's just um i think about the katie perry weekend every almost every day because that was a precursor number one the katie perry incident happened number one on friday and it was a normal night. I was in my office. Team was downstairs or somewhere. And the TV in our bedroom comes on. And it's, bla- it's just blasting. And it's playing Katy Perry's the song title, I think, Dark Horse. Um, at that time, the first time it was playing, I just hear a song. It's loud. What the heck is going on? I walk into the bedroom, and the TV's blasting. And I turn it off. I grab the remote, click. Tina comes in behind me, like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'll turn the TV off. And she's like, oh, I thought that was you. I'm like, no, the TV just came on by itself and started blasting. We part ways, go back to our respective rooms. Five minutes later, it comes on again, playing the same song. Then I knew something was up because it's five minutes done past. I shouldn't be hearing the same song five minutes later. On a, on a music channel. I go into the room. Tina's not too far behind me. And it's playing that Katy Perry song. But then I'm listening to the lyrics. Because now it keeps saying. Are you ready for the perfect story? It's a part of the song. It's not repetitive. It's just it comes on. The TV comes on playing the verse of. Are you ready for the perfect storm? The perfect storm. Uh, because once it's here and it's, it's, it's her lyrics of, I'm going to bring it, but you know, you're about to be messed up or whatever. And we turn the TV off with the remote control. Then I unplug it. I'm like, the ghosts are messing with us. Okay. I'm going to plug the TV now. I know they're not going to plug the TV back in and then turn it on and play the song. Okay. They know, I mean, that's just impossible. I'll just be way out of their league to actually physically plug a TV back in and the TV can't come on if it's not plugged, right? Right? Oh, it's, it's not, not supposed to, yeah. <laughs> not supposed to, yeah. So, 
problem solved. Ha ha, ghost, try something else. I go back into my office, and five minutes later, the song comes on again. Same verse, are you ready for the perfect storm? Perfect storm, da 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 da. Dark horse is coming, dark horse is coming. Tina's followed me in the room. The TV is blasting, and the TV is not plugged in. The cord is laying on the floor. And is, and the, is the picture on, or is it just the audio? It's a picture, but it's a black screen. It's just a black screen. It's not the black screen from the TV being off. Right. It's just a black screen from it being on, a, I don't know, a non-signal, non-tuned station or whatever. And it's blasting, and then we start analyzing the lyrics of the song, me and Tina, and we're like, oh, my God, Dark Horse, you ready for the perfect storm, da 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 I'm the Dark Horse, and all this stuff. Do you want to play with magic? You should know what you're getting, getting yourself set up for. And you guys are probably here. like, no, no, we're not. We're good. No, no, we're no, fine. No, this, is, <laughs> this is Friday. And um, so, yeah, so we, we, we uh, I changed the channel from the TV the music goes off. It never came back on. Once again, I only did that three times, that, that number three again. And that was Friday. And Saturday and Sunday was crazy activity. That's the Saturday was the day all the light fixtures upstairs exploded. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the wiring got pulled out from the other side of the light fixtures. Uh, you're talking about porcelain and debris and dust everywhere. Uh, the bedroom door got yanked off the shingles. Uh, the kitchen got ransacked and messed over. Uh, the armoire got thrown again. Um, Tina got Tina was run out the house because she was home alone that that Saturday when all when all that stuff went down. She saw one of the light domes explode. It really exploded right in front of her. And then Sunday was also when more objects got thrown, bar stools, and other heavy objects in the hallway. The loud bangs, the loud thuds. Uh, kitchen cabinets. Um, the armor got thrown so many times we had to move it from the hallway back into one of the guest bedrooms. Of course, that didn't stop it from getting thrown again. We just thought it would, but it didn't. And um, yeah, if you're listening to that song, it was it was really setting us up, telling us it's about to get worse for you guys um, because the whole lyrics of that song, uh, the part that kept replaying over and over, was "Are you guys ready for the perfect storm?" and it's about to uh, bring it, and the fact that the song is titled "Dark Horse" or "Black Horse" just blew my mind. The fact that it chose that song yeah. out of the universe of millions of songs and a Comcast radio PlayStation, and was able to control just that five minutes of it. Let's not even forget the part of the TV coming on by itself, uh, with no physical electricity running through it. I don't know. That's just that's. Yeah. That's not paranormal to me. That's supernatural. Right, right. And it, and yeah. again with the threes, right? You said it played three times. Played three times, yeah. Three times. It was three times. Yeah, three times the charm, uh, I believe they was thinking. Because, yeah, a lot of sets of threes. And that was one of them. Well, yeah, now we get to talk about the Bibles, Keith. These these poor Bibles and what they went through and what they meant to you guys and what you were trying to do by putting them out and what they were trying to do by destroying them. Yeah, going back to, like I said, we, we went to the internet for information on how to deal with this early on. We've had the house blessed. Everybody's given us suggestions. And, and, and these are good suggestions. Um, they're having negative effects, however. One of the suggestions was you have to display your religious belief openly. Um, I've, I've owned these Bibles since I was in college. These are Bibles I've had for 12, 15, 18 odd years. So there was always in my closet. So when the suggestion was put a Bible out somewhere in your home, a sacred part of the home, and two of Psalms or Proverbs, and y'all pray before y'all go to bed, and these really uh, tell the spirits that they can't stay here. And that sounded like good advice. And like you said, the first Bible went missing in 2012. That was the first time we tried that idea. And it stayed missing for about a year and a half. It was gone for a year and a few months. Um, The day it returned was soon after the activity came back in 2014 uh, when we were sleeping and uh, we had crazy activity that day but that night we woke up to the fire alarms going off it was like 1:34 in the morning and we had the front 
our bedroom door closed because objects would get thrown in, so we closed the door. Mm. And we opened up the door, and there, there's a book on fire on the, on the hallway floor, right in the doorway. A book on fire. And I closed it or doused the flames by closing it with my foot. And that's when I knew it was the missing Bible. And inside it was a wooden cross that we had, had nailed to the wall above our headboard as a means of protection. And that wooden cross was also in the Bible, that, and it also was scorched. Uh, we went to bed. That cross was over, above our headboard when we went to bed. Um, so, yeah, that was the first Bible to caught fire. Uh, Bible 2 and Bible 3 would get catch fire uh, a week and two weeks after that. And the first or the second one, uh, I went missing one Sunday morning for maybe a few hours. It was on our hallway bookshelf. And me and Tina even noticed it. We even acknowledged, hey, the Bible that we placed on the hallway bookshelf is now gone. This is how often things would go missing in our house. You could sit something down, a remote control or something, and it's gone. A shaver, a toothpaste, toothbrush, and it's gone. And sometimes that shaver or toothbrush will reappear on the other side of the house where it should be. So we thought the Bible was gone, and we was like, oh, man, it's going to come back when we're sleeping again. Please don't do that. Well, it came <laughs> back a few hours uh, that same day on the kitchen counter, and there's a video on my YouTube channel of that yeah. scene. I, I film it while, right when it's happening, mm. and um, there's an EVP on there. There's an EVP as we're looking at the crunched up pages, and I didn't find an EVP. Somebody watching the video did. Um, a voice utters, Jesus Christ. Uh, while me and Tina are talking about the singed pages um, of the Bible. Uh, a week later was when we had house activity. Once again, email box or inbox fills up with emails. I come home, the house is upside down. Furniture is destroyed. Kitchen's a mess. My office looks like Hurricane Sandy lived there. And the Bible is sitting on the bookshelf. And it's, it's the worst Bible that's ever got burnt. It's on my YouTube channel. And the interesting about this Bible is there's no smoke residue, no ash or soot on the carpet, on the shelf. And there's two shelves. The Bible's sitting on the first one. There's a shelf above it, and there's no burnt markings on the shelf above it that makes you that you would think due to the heat of the Bible burning would leave a mark on that shelf. There's nothing on the wall. There's no transplacement of burnt debris anywhere but that bible has not been moved at all and that was the last bible to get burned but it was not the last bible to get destroyed or go missing keith were the bibles burned in the same location in the bibles as far as chapter and verse or was it all different <laughs> Uh, it's all different. Um, multiple chapters got burned, so we couldn't pin. We tried to ascertain was one chapter specifically picked on, but you're looking at about five to ten chapters all scorched and burnt. Okay. Um, Steve Mara, it was interesting. One of the Bibles that got relocated off the hallway and put in my office where they specifically – put um, a marking on it to point to uh, a chapter and I think it was uh, Habakkuk chapter, but um, I can't remember specifically, but um, there was one instance where they seemed to want to draw reference to a passage. Mm. Um, that's in the documentary. Steve Mara calls attention to it um, as to what that could mean or why was that specific called out. Mm. But um, yeah, multiple Bible instances uh, and we think that is because, like I said, they're trying to they're trying to discourage me and Tina as we're trying to rid them of the house of them. They're trying to lower our willpower and let us know these things don't work on us. Uh, we can burn Bibles all day, keep them coming, keep them coming, uh, because we try Bibles, holy water, candles, everything the church gave us, the Virgin Mary. Um, sage. I mean, they took sage stick and wrote on the walls uh, with sage stick. And I tried. I can't do that. I tried to mimic what they did to see how in the world did they do that. And I couldn't do it, but they obviously could. And you knew it was sage stick because like, you could maybe smell the sage ash on the wall? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, you can smell the sage ash on the wall. There's some residue on the floor. And the sage stick itself is still warm to the touch or considerably smaller than when you left it that morning. So when you go up the, and you guys will see this if you, and I encourage you to go to his YouTube channel and see some of these videos. You can see the layout of the house and everything that we're talking about. When you go to the top of the stairs, the bookshelf he's talking about is at the very end of the hallway. and But you can see it straight away when you reach yeah. a, a certain point of the stairs. Was that there when you guys moved in or did you guys put that up? No, the hallway, those bookshelves were there when we got there. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. Yeah, it's just anything that went up there just did not want to stay. Yeah, the candles got thrown off. Even books, my IT books, nothing that you put up there, ashtray, it doesn't necessarily have to be religious in nature. Yeah. It would just throw that stuff off. And the Bibles were just one of those things that got tossed off that bookshelf. Um, but the only thing that really got burned were was Bibles. the Bibles. Yeah. Yeah, the Bible's are the only books that got burned. Tina's got shredded into confetti. Yeah. Uh, her Bible, uh, a few, some Bibles got thrown at me while I was taking a shower. Uh, there would, um, yeah, there's a chapter in my book um, where I'm taking a shower and a Bible. I didn't know it was a Bible until after I turned the lights on because they threw something in the room. I hear a bang. I hear a swoosh. The light goes off and something slams the door shut. Now imagine something gets thrown in with you. Light goes off and door shut all within a second. Mm. And you're just waiting for the kill shot. That's what you <laughs> it's, yeah. it's black. And you're like, I'm gone. This is how they're going to find me. Oh, man, it's going to be so embarrassing. So they're going to find me. It's the worst the timing, you know? It's the worst timing. And you turn on the lights, and there's a Bible soaking wet in the shower. And there's yeah. uh, the door closed, and the house is empty because, yeah, Tina's not home. Yeah. They're just always making a mockery. You know, especially with the Bibles and the crosses and finding the cross inside the Bible. It was just kind of like one of those things you're going, really, guys? Really? You had to really take it to that level? Yeah. Crosses upside down, bent crosses, burnt crosses, missing crosses, all crosses in the house neatly aligned together and put on your entertainment center, all of them upside down. The cross that reappeared in the washing machine. Um, yeah, there's just, yeah, you name it, everything religious is just to make mockery or just to, you know, really beat you down to say that doesn't work on us. Um, yeah, it's very disheartening. It, it, it does lower your morale. I mean, we had to be deeply rooted, me and Tina, and um, it's hard. It was hard. I mean, it, it was it was hard. I would not wish it on my worst enemy. It was hard. Well, let's move to your office. We talked about the hallway and how much activity was going on there, but there was... Um... I would hazard to say even more <laughs> going on in your office at one point with all of the writings on the wall. Yeah. And we touched on that a little bit in the beginning with uh, why Ghost Adventures didn't take any samples of what was going on in your office. Yeah, the office, I think I'd say in my book, is probably the most active hall, um, room in the house, the hallway being the most dangerous. Um, and they're kind of tit for tat. It's almost a tie between them. The office had the first fire, which was the poster fire. The, object, the office has had numerous objects thrown in while I'm at my computer workstation. Numerous electrical issues. Uh, you've seen the trash videos and the trash photos. Um, and the office, out of all the rooms in the house, is the only room to ever have wall writings. Um, no, other, no other room can have wall writings. And as you've seen on the videos and photos, some of these were upside down crosses. A lot of them were six, 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 and a lot of them were the upside down stick figure uh, of a man. Others were what appear to be footprints and just a lot of weird stuff. Um, I have a lot of theories why the office was the most crazy and the most dark room in the house. Um, I did find out that, um, the previous tenant's son, the one who was sick, that was his room. That was that uh, that room mm -hmm. did belong. That room did belong to him. I've seen shadowy figures in the doorway of that of that office. Um, I'm pretty sure that's where he saw them, uh, being sick and being con uh, confined to a bed all the time. And also, it was also uh, the man cave or AKA uh, command center for me to document and record. 
uh, a majority of the phenomena taking place because um, they would trash my computers, my monitor. They would manipulate my Wi-Fi, my router, my cable modem, uh, my TV, the electrical stuff. Uh, yeah, they would do all that uh, in the office, and they would throw things. Um, or if I would come out of my office and see there in front of me in the on the floor of the hallway, um, or my clothes upside down laying on the floor, or candles in the shape of a cross on the floor, or the uh, wax smears on the wall right outside my office. And let's not forget the gray lady is where I saw her for the first, oh, well, all the time. Every time I saw the gray lady or the white lady apparition was in my office. Right. Yeah, so the office, um, office is our own, his own haunted house within a haunted house, if you will. And before we get to the rest of what was going on in the office, because there was a lot, um, at one point you got really fed up and I could see <laughs> any sane person doing this. I'm pretty sure I would because I can be feisty too. Is you, you finally got really pissed and you went upstairs and you wrote out on a piece of paper basically saying, come at me guys, let's do this. I'm sick of this crap. Let's And you stuck it on the wall of yeah. your office. Bad move on my part because, um, yeah, I was frustrated. Uh, little sleep the night before, a lot of noise. They kept me and Tina both up at night, and you're right. I grabbed a Sharpie and grabbed uh, five papers out of my printer tray and start writing, hey, let's bring it, bring it. It's on now. I'm the captain of the ship. You guys can't you know, taunt me or kick me out of my own house. Show me what you got. And I wrote that and taped it on every wall in the office. And um, let me tell you, the gloves really came off then because I didn't know at the time, but I know now. Um, you, when you do that, you really do what they want you to do. And when you turn on something like that, you can't turn it off. They do. And I, I had really given them permission because keep in mind, after I did that, the activity stopped being a, happening around the house. The activity started happening around me. Yeah, I think I talk about where there's one time or a lot of times in the book where I would leave one room, every room I walk out of, the room I walk into, the light go off. So I can walk out of my office and into the hallway, the hallway light goes off. I walk out of the hallway into the master bedroom, the hallway light comes back on, the light in the master bedroom goes off. I could be typing or washing dishes in the kitchen and an object gets thrown within inches of me in the kitchen or in my office. And we, and one of the wall writings was the die KL. They started writing die KL, which is my initials, all over my office, all over my car, all over the front lawn, the side lawn, and other parts of the house. My neighbors would ring my doorbell in the morning and say, dude, your car is open. I'm like, what do you mean it's open? Every car door, trunk door is open. This happened numerous times. The electrical problems with the car started happening where constant horns blinking, going off in the middle of the night, uh, disturbing neighbors, brake lights flashing, but there's nobody in the car, so why are the brake lights flashing? All of that happened after I left those nasty notes uh, on my mind. I was frustrated. I was tired. I was sleep deprived. This is the part of the affliction, the vexation of being you're you're going through eight months of this now you're probably on the seventh month mm. of this uh the finger pointing is starting to set in uh that time me and tina are arguing back and forth people are not showing up when they say they was going to we're chasing the priest down he's mia other teams are mia ghost adventure is not responsive so yeah all that stuff combined you know i'm, I'm being pretty much primed for the kill at that point so what about the upside down man? We we all know the six 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 and what that may entail. But did you find out any from anybody? They're like, oh, upside down man. Here's what this may mean. Yeah, the upside down man was sort of. Um, I guess they sort of tipped themselves off because you're right. Most previous poltergeist related phenomena are there are previous documented cases of six 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 of upside down crosses. 
But I cannot find anything on record about an upside down mess. So when I saw that, I knew that's something new. That's something I can actually go to Google and try to find, and maybe I get lucky. And I did. It was very easy to describe in Google search upside down man stick figure. And it is a Native American symbol. It's a pictogram, which means a man has died or a man is about to die. And that was very hard to hear and understand that or read that in the office that I'm in with Die KL written all over the place. And now there's an upside down man in my office above me, on the side of me, and under me. And that's what it means. It's very simple in nature in the sense of Native Americans and their language, you know, pictogram, calligraphy. It means a man has died or is about to die. Mm. And, um, yeah, I, I, and, that, and that was done about five or six times, the upside down man um, in the office, only the office. And that was my office. Keith, what's your closest guess as to what that substance was that these writings are appearing as? Well, I did find out what the Halloween substance was, which was, was if you watch the Ghost Adventures episode, that's the Halloween stuff. That's the substance that appeared the night of Halloween. Ghost Adventures told us not to paint over that, believe it or not, before they came, because we're about to have it painted over because the priest said, paint over there, he'll come bless it. Ghost Adventures said, no, we want to see it, we want to document, we want to film it. Mm-hmm. And that's what gave me rights. Okay, they're going to get a sample of that. But they did it. Mm. Well, when they left and didn't get a sample of that, um, I did have it painted over. However, um, a year later, after Steve and Don had left, I realized that I had missed the spot because they had wrote that on my closet door as well. And it was a portion of the sliding closet door that I didn't paint over because it was hidden. So I took the door off the, uh, the rails, if you will, and got a saw, a chisel saw, and carved out a piece of it and uh, took it to my job, my coworker who works in the lab. I work for a, com- a hardware manufacturing company. It was his idea after learning of my story that, hey, I can test your wall sample upstairs in our lab department because his department um, tests paint all over the world, meaning the, the stuff that my company makes, they have to make sure what paint or ingredients are in there before these ingredients enter countries. Mm. So he was able to uh, take the chisel piece of wall with me, with him, of course, and it's called an XRD gun. Um, and what it does is it sends a lot, I don't know, radioactive, whatever, uh, and is able to immediately within seconds tell you what material, what the paint is made out of. And when he hit it with his gun, XRD or XRF gun, and he came back, it was organic. It came back, I think, 90 to 95% phosphate, um, calcium and something else and it's organic organic all organic he's like mm. this is not paint this is not paint uh, he, and he didn't know he didn't know what it was he's like well, it's not paint I'm not picking up anything that would suggest this is paint um, but my machine is telling me that this is organic and you're right it is so I took what he got off his gun And I start calling the local art galleries in around Seattle. I call Seattle Art Gallery. And I called the art gallery in Los Angeles, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. And each one I call, I just call casually. And, you know, you got to run through a lot of people before you get somebody to talk to you. And I just say, hey, I got this little deal. trying to ascertain what it is. I would like to get some more of it. But. And it's, oh, well, what's it made out of? What it got? And I, and I would tell them. And I would start telling them, hey, it's got 90% phosphate, 20% calcium or whatever. And they're like, well, it sounds like that's bone black. It's a, there's only, and each art gallery, not knowing what the other person is telling me, they all came up with, oh, that's bone black, especially the art gallery in Chicago. Mm. Now, I didn't know what bone black was. I'm like, oh, that's a, oh, that's what kind of paint it is. But I remember, but it's not paint. Well, then the guys told me, well, bone black um, is um, incinerated buffalo bones. Oh, my God. It's incinerated cow bone or bison bones. And I'm like, what do you mean incinerated? He's like, well, um, in the 1800s, 
during the, the frontier days, you know, there was there was a mass hunting of buffalo. Well, carcasses, you know, buffalo was hunted for its fur. So the carcass would be left out on the prairie and on the plains. And for a period of time, you just had buffalo bones. I mean, you had a, a, a this everywhere. It was bison bone everywhere. And it finally, somebody came up with the idea that you could make uh, a paint substance by the bone itself. And if you get it to a certain temperature, you produce what is called bone black. Because bone black produces its own derivative binding agent. Wow. Because bone black by itself is just powder. Because it's just fossil, it's just burnt bones. It's just mm-hmm. ash. But it does produce its own binding agent, which every paint needs a binding agent or it won't stick to your surface. Bone black produces its own called dipples oil. And therefore, the dipples oil combined with the bone black will make it a paint. And Native Americans use this early on, or multiple civilizations use this early on for calligraphy and pictography. Once again, this is sort of linking back to the Native American symbol of some of the phenomena or seem to be Native American in nature uh, because the bone black we was did determine to a 90% surety of, yeah, it's bone black. Um, there's only one store in the entire world that produces it and they don't produce it in large quantities. Um, I went to all the paint stores near my house and asked them, hey, can I get some bone black? I would like to come pick up a gallon. And they looked at me like, what the hell are you talking about? So where was the one place that actually manufactures that? Ah, there's a um, bone black manufacturer in Chicago. Interesting. To this day, um, does bone black. And uh, if you Google bone black, um, dirty jobs, I I remember the show called Dirty Jobs. It used to come Discovery Channel Channel. Um, that guy forgot his name. He did the episode on Bone Black. Mike Rowe did. Yeah, awesome. Mike Rowe did. I'll have yeah, to look did. that yeah. up. Back in the nineties, it's about our episode. He went to that manufacturer and they even tell you about, you know, how you make it, what's uh-huh. made from, where it come from. And um so yeah, I got my uh, education on Bone Black, but going back wow. to the house once again, um yeah, why Yeah, why it's in your house. Juice? It's in my house. In Bothell, Washington. In Bo- in Bothell, Washington. <laughs> Uh, yeah, go figure. Unbelievable. That is so interesting with the um, how they make the bone black. And it's, uh, I mean, that's a, a kind of an, an ancient process there, right? Yeah, it's, it's I mean, the compared darkest. compared to what we do now. Yeah, it's, a, it's used as a filter primarily nowadays, uh, bone black is. And it's probably one of the most darkest uh, hues of black. Um, Rembrandt, the famous artist Rembrandt, uh, loved to paint with it. That was his paint of choice mm-hmm. in regards to uh, the color black. Um, and so, yeah, it was very, uh, that just blew my mind. I mean, that just blew my mind. Um, you can't apply it with your hand or with a brush because if you see the markings, um, artists have told me you, you can't apply that. The, the application method is almost as profound as the ingredients itself, the, the way it was applied on the walls and ceiling, ceiling too, yeah, yeah. Uh, in that office. How, how did they how think did it was applied then? Oh, oh man, they don't, they, they, they're clueless. I mean, several artists have looked at it. They said it would have taken them days to do that. And they still don't know how they do that. They say it would take them, obviously it, it can be done, but the exact method and way it appeared uh, on my wall, and people can look at the close-ups, because I got several videos about Bone Black on my channel, and look at the close-ups. Um, they, they don't know. They said they would take it. I mean, you talk, they said it would have taken an enormous amount of time. Nobody can hoax that. You can't do that to your office. And, I mean, what are you going to do? Take a month off and, and do that? For yeah, they just yeah, these are artists and they, they could not. Uh, Steve covers it in his documentary uh, about the application method and how it's just profound how the method of a application is just as mysterious as the bone black itself because the spirits chose bone black for a reason. It's just something you just call out of thin air. Um, where they get it from, you know, where do they get the bone black from? How long do they have it? When, whenever they. How long did they have? How long did they have it? It just it just begs a lot of questions. 
Well, and I want to point out to everybody, because in chapter 26, you actually go out of town to Spokane, Washington, and the activity actually seems to follow you. So if you could just touch on that really quickly. Yeah, that's uh, probably in and around the time after the, the notes on the wall, because that time when I would go to Spokane, I would go for work, and I'm working out of Spokane probably for about a week. And um, the interesting about me getting attacked in my hotel in Spokane in the middle of the night is having sheets yanked off the bed while sleeping. Uh, a lot of electrical issues. I can't tell you how many times the hotel IT came to my office to respond to uh, internet difficulties, and they leave scratching their heads. Everybody's Wi-Fi is working on that floor except mine, or internet, or TV, or phone. And then also the poking and the prodding, which followed, which I talk about a lot in my book, of sleeping, and something's jabbing me through the mattress or through the sheets or through the pillow in my rib cage or kidney area or shin or knee or, or ankle. And that's starting to happen more and more when I travel abroad. And that's sort of troubling because now I'm starting to worry because at that time we always entertain the idea of just cutting and running and leaving. But if it's happening in the hotel, then we might not be solving the problem by leaving because I'm, I'm getting sheets yanked off me um, while sleeping. Mm-hmm. And it's a very, it's very abrupt. And one time I got attacked at the hotel and Tina and her best friend Kim got attacked at the house the same night. And that's just unreal. Wait a minute. If if some if who if somebody's with me, who's right. still at home? Right. Yeah, and and that was uh, yeah. Yeah, they definitely seem to have all the bases covered with you guys. They didn't care who was home, who wasn't home, who was how far away. They didn't care. They didn't care. They they they, they did not. They didn't care. Oh, you got a guest spending the night with you? Okay, we're gonna terrorize her too. And they did with Kim. They um. Uh, you heard you read that part of the chapter where yeah. Kim is sleeping and the door is slamming and Tina's afraid to go wake her up. And that morning they got they may both get run out of the house yeah. by the level of activity. And at the same time, I'm having my my uh, hotel room attacked. So um, yeah, that that was uh, that was crazy. Now you had a couple different teams come in uh, for m- sometimes months at a time. And they, they also captured incredible evidence, which you say was the difference between them and ghost adventures, because ghost adventures really only has four to six or seven hours of, of time to where they can actually spend time in the home and maybe poking and prodding the activity there. But you had, uh, you had Don and Steve and then Mary and Nikki and all of those folks encountered what you guys did. Yeah, and there's something to be said about living at a place versus, oh, we're just visiting for a few hours. Um, there's other variables as to why ghost visitors didn't get in there, but the main one is they were there for a short period of time. And um, when Nikki and them stayed there, you're right, they stayed three weeks, which is an eternity from an investigator's point of view, because you're living in the house, you're sleeping, you're getting up in the morning. When they get up, they, they investigate, but they're not really investigating hardcore. They're, they're doing it in a gradual sense. And phenomena is happening around them that they're just witnessing. They don't even have their gear out. They just see, oh, the light's going off and on. Oh, that door just slammed. I mean, Steve and Dawn saw front doors open and close by themselves. Uh, they saw a beach ball go through a table. Uh, they hear the pitter-patter of footsteps. And I'm and when Nick and them were there, I was not even in the house. And then when Steve and Donna are witnessing phenomena, I'm standing right next to them. So it was good for them to live in the house because everything I've been documenting and reporting, hey guys, around this time eight o'clock is when the phantom footsteps pick up. And sure enough, eight o'clock rolls around, the phantom footsteps pick up. So it was really reinforcing and they really started okay, this guy's telling the truth. This guy's really knows his house versus a team that comes in. Hey, we're ghost adventures. We're here for five hours. You guys are going to go stay in a hotel while we got this. And what people don't realize we have phenomena in our hotel that night while they were in the home, but nobody, nobody never checked on us. We had so much electrical problems. The lights would not cut off in the hotel when we went to bed or they kept coming on and, uh, nobody would call or see this, you know, this, just have a thought experiment. Hey, I wonder if Keith and Tina are having anything. 
I mean, maybe the activity has followed them. Maybe the activity is centered around them. We'll put one person on them and we'll stay over here. Let's put somebody in a hotel next to them. You know, all these different things you could have done. But, um, yeah, the teams that did catch evidence lived in the home and they got a treasure trove. I mean, uh, Nikki Novell and Mary, um, got some of the best EVPs I've ever heard. I mean, it was just unreal. Uh, the experiments they were able to conduct, uh, and see, and then Stephen Don got more EVPs and saw physical phenomena. I mean, it's rare you see the physical phenomena with your own eyes, but, um, Steve was just blown away because he was like, whoa, I mean, most, I'm not going to say most teams, but some teams think the house occupants have a tent to exaggerate so you can just show up. We never exaggerated our claims. We, there's no there's no reason to. And at early on, Stephen, I sort of thought some of the things were just too far-fetched, but we're here now, and you don't have to exaggerate anymore, Keith. We're here now. But they saw the physical phenomena, and they had to change their game plan because they realized these spirits are intelligent, but they're evasive. And if you don't pivot your experimentation, their evasiveness will get the best of you. And they was able to change their methodology midway through and capture phenomena after they realized these spirits are not going to just give you the evidence. They're not going to just throw it to you and land it in your lap. But they will reveal themselves if you use scientific methods. And that's what they did. And Keith, I don't want to diminish what went on between you and Tina because we didn't cover that very much. We talked a lot about the activity But you guys went through a lot, and it's all in the book, and you were very detailed in that, and I appreciated that part because you were very candid as far as what was going on with you and Tina. But the culmination of this whole thing is that you guys did, in fact, break up. And um, considering what happened with the previous tenants, you know, I'm I'm just... It, it's kind of seeming like the theme of the home. Um, they're happy to do these sorts of things. And um, I mean, do you still talk to Tina or do you still have any activity to this day where you're living? Because I know you're, you're not still in the Bothell home that, that we're talking about now. Do you guys even still talk and does, do either one of you have activity still? Uh, I had activity, um, Early on, when moving into my new location, the water puddle phenomena happened on day two at my new location where I live now. Um, there were intermittent electrical issues the first three or four months of living in the new place. The only remnant I can say that still happens to this day, and it happened yesterday, it happened the day before, for me, is the poking and the prodding while sleeping mm. and the heartbeats coming and the pulsation through the mattress. Oh gosh. Oh, and that's, you know what? We didn't even touch on that. And that was in my notes. If you could just talk about that, because that was also something really, truly freaky because you guys didn't have animals and you likened it to like a cat kind of pouncing on the bed and just slowly yeah. creeping up to you. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the post, the post sitting mattress and Nikki felt it with her own hands and Steve and uh, Dawn did too. Um, is basically you're you're laying on your mattress, you're sleeping or you're watching TV or whatever, and something inside the mattress jabs you in your torso multiple times, or something tugs at your feet or yanks the sheets off the bed. When you're sleeping in the middle of the night, you feel a heartbeat or a pulsating mattress underneath you. It's on several, it's underneath several parts of your body. Primarily the pillow, underneath the pillow. You can raise up off your bed, throw the sheets back, and lay your hand flat on the spot where you felt the pulsating and literally feel a beat, a heart beat. It's a throbbing. It's not coming from your person. It's coming from the mattress. Now, this has been going on for like eight months before any team came to the house, primarily on me. And Nikki was able to experience it when she came to investigate because it happened one night and I called her to the room and she put her hand there and she felt it and she documented it and she gave several interviews about it. Steve and Dawn went a step further and put motion detect devices and sensitivity devices on the mattress and then sealed the room off. 
and this is on the documentary. And when they sealed the room off a few minutes later, the motion detect alarms start ringing and going off. Now, that's one instance of why you can say, oh, well, it could be anything why those things are going off. They respond to the room. They have to remove the tape area, the tape off the door. They have to unseal the room, dart in. The devices that they had on the bed are no longer on the bed. Mm -hmm. They're resting on the floor. And when they put their read or EMF read devices on them, they have a high concentrate of EMF. I think it was nine milligauss from the devices and from the area that the devices were sitting on. Mm. And um, it just blew them away. Uh, but yeah, that still happened in, my, in current location. Uh, me and Tina are still friends. We do. We did break up. Um, there's a man, there's a manipulative psychological component through all hauntings, mine included, uh, as that's uh, detailed in my book about what the spirits did to get me and Tina at odds with each other. We were totally unaware. We were totally unprepared naive, whatever you want to call it, that's what we were. Um, I tell people at the early part of this book, this is not a Hollywood book. This book is not going to have a happy ending. Two couples that we know of did not survive, relationship did not survive. That's the previous tenant and Keith and Tina. There were a lot of variables that affected me and Tina uh, that led to our breakup. Oh, I, that's what that's what I wanted to bring up, Keith. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Was what did Tina find that really? I mean, to me, when I was reading the book, I was like, "Oh, this is really super bad." What did she find in your bed? When when after she had gone out of town, mind you, oh. bad timing. Oh yeah, this is uh, early on to get me and Tina because we were doing everything the priest had told us, and the house was relatively quiet for a little bit. We thought we had gotten ahead of everything, but you're right. Tina went on a business trip. And when she returned, she was making up the bed, and she found a female jury. I think it was an earring um, in the bed, and it was not hers. And she went ballistic. Most women would. And that had about been the second time she's found a uh, female jury that didn't belong to her um, in the house while she was away. Right, the other and, one was like in the hallway, right? Yeah, Another it was in the hallway. area. Yeah, yeah, and that one I brought to her because I thought it was hers. Right, and, and I said, "Oh, this yours." Um, my argument at the time was, "Remember where what house we live in? We have multiple things disappearing, and and that may be why spirits take certain things because they can implant it in different homes and create all kind of mischief." But yeah, that that right there was the beginning of the end because we stopped doing the prayers together. We start calling, we stopped calling uh, churches and paranormal teams together. I mean, we had uh, good moments, but they start becoming far few in between with each new instance. As you notice in the books, you start questioning me where I got this from, this cross from. I know I bought this cross in Spokane and she would look at me with a frown face like, right. you know, and that's what these spirits were doing. And that's what they did. Uh, with some of my stuff when, like I said, the coffee cup or the scratches to my car after Mantina had an argument, I thought she had keyed my car and I realized she didn't because I checked the ADT logs. But those are detailed um, in the book. And it's a gradual thing. It's a manipulative thing because once you get the finger pointing going and we would have spats, the activity would spike up that night. It would really go from zero to ten and then later in, in the year, the activity would just spike around me. If Tina was mad at me or we had a little spat, then I gave the spirits permission to just throw. I mean, I, I've had chef knives thrown at me numerous times, glass candles thrown at me, um, a lot of stuff. Once Tina left the room, the spirits were throwing stuff at me. She's been scratched. Tina been knocked multiple times. She's been scratched, razor thin scratches on her body. And that was just adding to the vexation. And yet, the the crux of it all, like I said, was her ill portrayal on Ghost Adventures of them making it look like she was sort of the the agent, and she was not the agent. Uh, but the portions of the paranormal community and portions of the uh, fans 
uh, lit Tina up in the blogosphere. Yeah. And I even tell her in the book of, hey, don't go to those websites because they're, they're trashing you tremendously. And um, yeah, and that really, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. So if you're still having activity, and it does seem like throughout the book, I got the, the feeling that it was more attached to you than it was yeah. to her. Is she having any activity where she's living now? Uh, she's not having any activity. I mean, knock on wood. Um, the deal about Tina is, um, yeah, she's not having activity. Um, I can't say she's having any attachments or whatnot. Right. Um, I do know toward the end, a lot of activity starts centering around me. There's multiple reasons uh, for that. Tina never saw the apparitions I did. This is like a 2012. She never saw the female apparition. Yeah. Um, She's never talked to uh, the previous tenant, Rhonda, the gray lady. She never talked to her. I did. She know of her. She know when I made contact with her. She know uh, what they went through and whatnot because we talked about it. But she never saw the gray lady. She believed me when I told her, hey, the gray lady just turned off my lights and took out running. But, um, yeah, she never she never saw it. And I'm kind of glad she did. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm glad I had the word die KL versus die Tina. Right. Um, and I'm glad – she never got attacked while traveling abroad. But, um, yeah, the water puddles happened day two of here. There's a video on that on YouTube. Um, the building maintenance responded and could not determine. There's no pipes in the ceiling. Oh, There's wow. no, there was nothing to show where that water came from. Uh, where were these puddles, Keith? Uh, the new place that was on my kitchen table. The water was dripping from the ceiling oh. onto the, uh, the kitchen table. Um, yeah, it was like uh, the second day of me moving in. Uh, and it hit my car keys the, the third day I moved in. I couldn't find my car keys. Um, there's a video. It's about an hour, two hours long um, of me moving out the old house. And um, the movers will show up because they're moving me. And I got voice recorders spread throughout the house, maybe three, I think, and one video camera. And you've heard one of the key EVPs. Um, when you watch that movie, you're going to hear about 45 because they start saying Keith, different voices start saying Keith over and over uh, toward the tail end of the video as the movers are finally getting all the last furniture out the house. And I'm about to lock it up because I got to go to the other house to let them in. And you start hearing these, they start, they start off very subtle. And then it's almost start like they join in like a song or something. Keith, Keith. Very, very, and that's, yeah, that was two days before the water puddle. I noticed that you were using the uh, the Zoom H1 recorder. Uh, that's the same one that I have, and it's so sensitive. It was so sensitive that it was the first. I had bought it right before I went to Fox Hollow Farm, and I was moving around far too much because this thing is so sensitive. So, <laughs> yeah, and you're laughing because you know, right? Because you're like, oh, yeah, I had those yeah. recordings where I was, like, moving it far. You have to, like, set it down because it, it'll yeah. pick everything up everything up everything. yeah yeah it's really really good so i just i mean so you have you have the book out you have the documentary out and we'll make sure that everybody knows where to find those before we we hang up but do you feel like every time you talk about this again that you're kind of you're in your new place you do have these things going on the keys go missing again which would drive me bonkers you have the water <laughs> The mattress thing again? I mean, is it... Do you think it's because you, you're still talking about it? Which I'm not... I mean, I totally get that. I would too. But do you think that if if you stepped away from it, maybe it would quiet down? Uh, I mean, well, I mean, the, the water was over two years ago. Uh, the key two years ago. Mm. Um, I don't know what would give right or give make the poking and the prodding stop. Um, is that I do every know night? Some, uh, it's about four nights a week. Jeez. Um, and primarily, it's and it, it, the time it happens after four a.m. It's only happened near sunrise uh, or night terrors, and the night terrors happen about once a week uh, or every other week. And um, I don't. I, I used to play musical bed in the old house. Yeah. Because uh, it, it would happen that maybe you had to just switch bedrooms, but in my new house, I don't have to p do that often. And um, I don't know. I do know when writing this book, and I'm talking about the writing portion of it, um, reliving and retelling, because I want the reader, I'm trying to put the reader in the house. 
I want them to be the third person in the house without getting anything on them. Mm-hmm. And um, so they're going to be sort of in between me and Tina, deciphering, learning, arguing, whatever. And you're gonna you're gonna be there. But um, it was hard to get the to relive that stuff and type it out. Uh, but I feel good now that I've done reading it, right. because I can I get a lot of people from all over the world who've had something similar, and everybody tells me. I'm glad you told that story because we caught hell from believers or disbelievers um, and, or they knew somebody in their family. Um, I live 20 minutes outside of Seattle and a lady emailed me from the U U district, which is about five minutes or it is in Seattle, the U village. Mm -hmm. And she's a college student and she says she's having similar things happening in her dormitory. And she just at her wits' end, and um, I asked her to describe, and she, and, and she just told me, "Yeah, wall writing stuff being thrown, knives thrown at me, scratches, and all that." And she got she caught one of mine because it, it made the local news. So yeah, there's there's other stories out there. The world just does not hear about them, and most people are fearful. And that's why the previous tenant didn't tell anybody, and that's why she needed two months to think about before she even told me. Um, and just to bring the point home, I don't, you know, I don't want to give any spoilers about the book because everybody should read the book. Uh, it's very um, extensive. But uh, going back to this, there's no happy ending. Yeah, um, she was successful in finally committing suicide. The previous tenant was, and she she could never really shake everything. She said all the bad started when they moved into that house, and um, she she never really landed on two feet again but she did thank me for going public with my claims uh the previous tenant did mm. um keith what about what about the bothell hill house now do you know who's living there do you know anything about those folks and what they may be going through uh it's a husband and wife they moved in uh, i think it was july two months after i moved out um they know that of the house and they know what took place in the house. It's sort of kind of impossible not to know those things. The house is very well documented and it's been on multiple, I mean, it went international with the TV show, but, um, and they were given portions of the evidence, um, to my, not, I have not talked to them. I have purposely avoid talking to them. I have purposely avoided knocking on their front door asking, Hey, you have an activity. I just, I don't feel it's my place. Um, one thing I do know about these spirits, if you go looking for them or go calling for them, even in a nonchalant way, they will th- take that as a means of, oh, you want to play? Let's play. Um, so um, I have to assume the house is quiet. One thing that Steve, Mara, and Don Phillips said is um, if the activity is a level one type activity, if it's very docile, um, it's quite possible phenomena is happening. You're just not aware of it. It's only when you engage the phenomena that the, the phenomena maybe escalates or tethers to you. Because keep in mind, um, and, I, and I'm just wired that way. In my world, plants don't fly. So if a plant gets knocked over, uh, I'm going to put a camera on that plant to see if it gets knocked over again. Right. That's all. That's all the spirit needs. Or why do I keep coming to my room and the lights off? I know I didn't turn the lights off. I'm not crazy. Well, about the 20th time of that happening, I'm going to put a camera in the hallway that watches my office when I leave. That's all the spirit needs to think you want to play with it. So I think as long as they avoid doing those things, they're okay. And also, um, other families have lived in the house and, and not reported anything. I have to assume that because nobody's come forward with this house being public as it is and maybe things will go dormant for a while i mean the previous tenant lived there four years before we arrived so um other families i have to think didn't go through anything but so far so good i mean they know the house is what it is the market in seattle right now is houses are good houses sell fast Mm -hmm. so it, it wasn't on the market long and um they don't have kids. It's a husband and wife, and they don't have children. Um, but it, it, it is a startup home, and I'm like Steve. That house is going to register 
one day in the future uh, with activity. We just don't know when. Well, and you touched on this earlier, but I think that most people would just, like you said, they move out. They don't. They don't even tell right. their their family about it. You know, their grandparents, right. their brothers and sisters, aunts yeah. and uncles don't know. They just go on with their lives. So yeah. I think that it would take someone else like you, Keith, to actually live in the house and be like, "Look, there's some really weird shit going on here, and I'm going to talk about it." Yeah, you're right. Because keep in mind, if we, if me and Tina would have left after the kid cough, let's just say we we moved out out of the kid cough, right, right? Right. None of this would be happening right now. Right. None of the spirits would still be there. They'll just be like, "Oh crap, they left, man," you know. But yeah, we, we we stayed and we stayed after all the major stuff because you're right. Most people just, hey, oh man, the kid cough, we're out of here. Call the owner or pet sliding across the floor, we're out of here. To a spirit, that's just that's just subtle stuff. I think the spirits. I think I really think the spirits were somewhat glad of, and also shocked that wow, they're still here. So therefore, they're here. We got to play with them. We got to write on walls we got to set fires because yeah we've they, they've probably done other things that people just ignored right. you know right how many people remember how many times oh did i turn that light off or on maybe the bulb did that maybe i'll call the electrician he'll come in and fix that but that could be a spirit behind that it could be a spirit be the reason why oh, i could have sworn i put my keys over there but they're over here now <laughs> i must be tripping you know those are things the mind just totally disavows and i couldn't do that because i'm just anal that way i just i just know everything i'm sort of a neat freak and i see my keys on the other side of the house i'm like i know i didn't do that (laughs) right no way no and there's so much more in the book and i didn't want to like give everything away on the show but like the and and i don't want you to expand on this because people should read the book it's there's so much information but the dime story i was like um oh oh my god (laughs) um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but yeah. they, you know there's just certain stories you're kind of going um i don't know if i would sleep after that and you guys kind of oh yeah the shadow just takes underneath a, the door yeah the oh knives. and yeah you're kind of going that wasn't the gray lady like that was a smaller shadow and i'm going that's yeah. way worse i don't know why but it's way worse <laughs> it's smaller it's smaller and yeah, way creepier for some reason, right? I don't know why, but in my brain I'm is. going, it's smaller and yucky and just, blah. no, uh-uh. So, all right, well, Keith, let's let everybody know where they can find the book and, of course, watch the documentary. Yeah, so the, the book, The Bothell Hell House, um, is on Amazon, um, both Kindle and paperback. The interesting thing about the book, like I said, is there's countless links to video and audio. Um, the reader is going to be able to uh, click on a YouTube link or a SoundCloud link. When we hear a noise or hear a bang or see something go flying, that link is in that chapter. So if you want to, you can have an interactive experience or you can just save it to the end. There's also links to other video and audio. Uh, there's reports from previous or from the paranormal teams that investigated the house and also it's just a lot of photographs of the phenomena and the aftermath there's email exchanges with me and ghost adventures there's email exchanges with me and priest there's email exchanges with me previous tenants and friends and family so all that's in the book um and it's on amazon and kindle and paperback um also, the documentary, which uh, the UK guy, Steve Merrin, Don Phillips, the producer and director is Don Phillips. He's one of the uh, researchers in the home. They stayed two and a half weeks, two trips, mind you, came all the way from the UK. And this is just the documented or videotape of them researching the house. They were doing a lot of video capture and uh, did include uh, Nick Kyle from the SSPR. Um, that documentary is about an hour and a half. Uh, long it's it's an hd you can view that online or stream it or download it it's on american supernatural.com website that's american supernatural.com website my website is demons in seattle.com one word demons in seattle.com more video more timeline more access to the book more report info 
Uh, but definitely the book is where you want to uh, dive in uh, first because it's going to start from 2012 and end in 2016. And I'm talking about, um, so you're looking at about 1,400 uh, claims of paranormal activity uh, from me and Tina. So, um, yeah, that's how you can get to those. And, of course, the YouTube channel, which we talked about a lot tonight. Yeah, I would definitely recommend uh Get in the book, of course. Like you said, a lot of detail there. We, I mean, I skipped a ton of stuff, and you know I did. And I, I mean, yeah. I have like six pages of notes here, and it's still a lot. But there's <laughs> still so much in the book. And again, a, like a virtual high five for all of the things that you tried to document and that you did for the YouTube channel. So everybody can go through there, pick and choose. Everything's very, uh, it's titled very easily. So if there's like an EVP, you can click on that. Okay, there's an EVP. That's what it is. So uh, I highly recommend everyone go to that at the very least. And it, hopefully it piques your interest to watch the documentary and get the book. But uh, Keith, thanks for all your time. And of course, your due diligence with this house. I don't know. It takes a certain kind of person to stay in a house for four years going through all that stuff. But, you know, you guys did it and you made, I mean, you did. You made the best of it. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on tonight. Um, it wasn't easy. Uh, I'm just glad the material's out there for others to view and see. And um, those who view and see it uh, are going to walk away convinced because there's a lot of compelling um, stuff and there's still stuff we're still finding and discovering um, because there's still evidence we've yet to compile and look at and once we find it and vet it uh, it goes straight to YouTube when it's done so definitely uh, subscribe to that channel and uh, you might catch something yeah and again it's under uh, Keith L or you can just type in the Bothell Hell House like I did at the onset yep. and it, it'll come up straight away well thank you yeah. so much Keith awesome thanks for having me it's great well, I'm so-and-so. I was given this name by my parents. I've been to such and such a college. I've done these things in my profession. I produce a little bar. The Buddha says, forget it. That's not true. That's some story. That's all gone. That's all past. I want to see the real you you are now. Well, nobody knows who that is. Because we don't uh, know ourselves except through listening to our echoes consulting our memories. But then there's a real evil, and that again leads us back to this question. Uh, who are you? That is the real evil. We shall see how they play with this exam by the co-ops to get you to come out of your shell and find out who you really are.
your funeral, you know, you will suddenly become somebody different, living somewhere else. They will say reincarnation means this, that if you sitting here now are really convinced that you're the same person who walked in at the door half an hour ago, you're being reincarnated. If you are liberated, you understand that you're not. The past doesn't exist. Zen master Dogen put it this way. He said, the spring does not become the summer. First there is summer, and then there is spring. Of history, 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 history. 